Good evening. Welcome to the school committee meeting of April 10th, 2022. Uh. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on WHCA. Uh, we do have Fred. Fred is on the phone. Yes, Fred? Yes. Welcome. So any votes we take will be roll call votes. But as we start with every meeting, if we could please uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under one nation, under God, liberty, and justice, and justice for all. Fred, we had you on delay. Yep. <laughs> Must be far away, Fred. Another time zone. Oh, I had to. I had to stand up so I could pledge allegiance. Yeah, oh, we should have, yeah, we should have given yeah. you a second. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> well, welcome everyone. We do have a very full agenda tonight, so we're going to do the best we can to keep it moving. Uh, the first item we do have is approval of meeting minutes. We have four sets of minutes. Uh, the first one would be for the, uh, I would be looking for a motion for the minutes of February 16th, 2022. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Steve. Yes. Shell. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Chris. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Fred. Yeah. Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. Beth. Yes. Great, unanimous. Be looking for a motion to approve the meeting minutes of March 8th, 2022. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, we'll try and follow the same order. Steve. Yes. Shell. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Chris Howard. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Chris Scriven. Yes. And Beth. Yes. Great. And Fred. And Fred. Yes. Sorry, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> I, the Chris Howard threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say my own name, let alone my last name. All right, uh, I'd be looking for a motion to approve the uh, school committee minutes of March 9th, 2022. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Steve. Yes. Shell. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Me. Yes. Fred. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. And Beth. Yes. Great. Thank you. And last but not least, I'd be looking for a motion to approve the meeting minutes of March 15th, 2022. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, we'll go the same order. Steve? Yes. Shell? Yes. Don? Can I just, oh, yes, yes. Steve? Yes. I'll vote yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Uh, Beth? Yes. Fred? Yes. All right, Whew. Love roll call votes. Um, all right, public comment. So we'll open it up for public comment. If anyone is here for public comment, please come to the mic now. Going once, twice, sold. All right, well, we will have some uh, public comment from our student advisory committee. I think we are missing a few folks that are participating in some extracurriculars, but we have Emma. Emma McKeon. Emma McKeon, so. Sophomore. Awesome. Hi, um, so one of the things we wanted to ask about, I've talked to a lot of my peers and we wanna know some stuff about the schedule if there's anything that it's come out, if it's been finalized, or do you know just anything really about it? Because we're all kind of out of the whim, and I know a lot of people are, a lot of people like it, but a lot of people don't. So, so do you, do you mind me deferring to your principal, illustrious principal in the back of the room? <laughs> Dr. Jones, did you hear that question? Did you hear that question? Yes, I did. Um, this, this Chris, question. Chris, come on up. Oh. Yeah, you, you can't hide back there. <laughs> <laughs> we have not finalized the schedule yet we do know that there will be seven periods for the students to make sure that they get offered as many options as they have course wise um, for electives and things right now we're looking at a cascade rotation which is a seven day cycle it's seven periods you drop two you drop one each day is what we're looking at so you'll have six periods a day Day one will be A, B, C, D, E, F. Day two will start with G, A, B, C, D, E, and then it'll just rotate through. So we don't have stagnant periods, so students don't see teachers at the same time. This um, has posed a, a couple issues. I don't like to say problems. They're issues that we're trying to work through and get creative around. One of them is restarting our internship program that we lost during COVID for the past year and a half, two years. Um, we're trying to figure out how that works into the cascading schedule. 
Um, we've got some ideas. We just have to be able to work through those ideas. A survey went out today to all the juniors to see who would be interested in an internship, um, what field they'd be interested in in that internship, so maybe we can get our hands in and help them get some placements based on how many there are. Um, the piece about senior privileges that there are students that are concerned about that I've heard from, I heard from a group of four students um, that wrote me a letter about senior privileges and the concern. As it is now, senior privileges, a student can leave campus or come in late based on if they have a seminar, that first block or that last block. By rotating the schedule the way we are and keeping those blocks from being static, seniors are no longer locked into that static block where they can leave. Um, that, one of the things about that is there, was, there would always be a mad rush of seniors to switch, trade, cajole, do whatever they could to get a seminar for one of those periods so that they could leave either early or come in late. Um, with the rotating schedule, that poses a problem, but we may have an answer to how we're going to adjust to that, where seniors, what will happen is, yes, seniors will have fewer opportunities to leave or come in late, but a greater number of seniors will have the opportunity to exercise senior privileges. So instead of being one of those seniors that was unable to get one of those seminar blocks and being stuck in the middle and not taking advantage of senior privs, now you'll get the chance to take advantage of senior privs um, as it rotates. Do you know when you're going to let the kids know when the final, <clears throat> when the final bell is going to ring and you let the students know because I think that's their concern? Yeah, I would say the final bell is going to ring probably mid-May the latest. We're, trying, we, we're getting close on some of those solutions that we're trying to trying to get to and we're we're doing it moving forward we're trying to get a schedule that's flexible enough that we can make some adjustments based on things like senior privileges internships without making a huge adjustment to the whole schedule that we can just pick and choose and kind of slide things around so that's what we're trying to come up with why we're trying to come up with some flexible answers that will in the future allow us to continue moving things around so next year may be a little sloppy as we figure it out or a small kind of pilot piece as we go forward thanks Chris answer your question you you might not want to go too far. <laughs> My one other question is, I know there's been a lot of talk on starting later, starting at different times. I just wanted to know if you guys had any, if there are going to be anything changing to it. So I, I can address that and say for next year, not, no, time's going to be the same. But it will be something I think this committee Last year we started something new, where this committee determined their goals and gave me some things to work on for the following year. I would ask this committee to do the same this June and work in subcommittees over the summer to see where those things, what the priorities might be for the district, and that might be something we can look at. I lived 705 for, for, for nine years. It's tough, I get it. Um, but I think it's something we might revisit coming forward. But for September of 2022, you're not going to see a change in the time. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, your exit stage left for you. you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We're moving to the superintendent. Yes. Floor. Thanks. Nothing else. You, you good? Yeah. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. Mama. So, um, thanks, Chris. We'll go right into. So, my evaluation's coming up. Um, last year, you everything's in the in your Google Drive. The rubric and the evaluation tool itself. The goal is to do that publicly at our June meeting. Um, over the next month, I'm going to be dropping things, uh, evidence into the drive that you can use to support however you want to evaluate me. I'm also open to, if you have any questions about this year, having a one-on-one, -on -one, come on up. As everyone knows publicly, it's a public evaluation, so you're not gonna evaluate me privately, but you have to do this publicly, and I'm looking to do that in June. Um, it worked well last year. I think I've given you some information this year, but I'm gonna formalize it in folders so you'll see under every goal and under every rubric, there will be pieces of evidence that we've done from last July on to support what I think um, me doing my job. So if you have questions over the next you know, month, uh, please let me know, we can meet, or um, give the, the finalized evaluation. Chris can set a timeline in May when he wants them in so he can review and then we can do it at the at the June meeting. So can we can, can we just talk through that timeline a little bit now? Yep. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So when you say the June meeting, you're looking to complete that June 8th. June 8th. And we reorganize on May 23rd. Mm -hmm. the, the people that are on this committee 
are, are bound to evaluate even if, even if they don't run again or are not elected. So they have to do the evaluation. New folks don't evaluate. Okay. So just kind of thinking through the timeline so people can plan. Um, when do you think you'll be done with your material? When will you be done putting materials in? Probably by the, by the first, second, first week of May, I'll be done. First week of May. Yeah. Before the next school committee meeting, all my, uh, as much evidence as I can get in that I think will be valuable to you, will be in before the next school committee meeting. Okay. So, I just like to have timelines. So if we say by mid-May, you're, so May 15th, you're done, and then that would give the school committee roughly two weeks to complete them and get them in. So if we said by June 30th, June 1st, something like that, does that all, does that work for everyone? Could you say you the date again? Like, uh, sorry, May 30th. 30th or June 1st. June 1st, if we said everyone has to have them in by Wednesday, June, June 1st. June 1st, does that sound reasonable? Okay. Yeah. And Chris, we get uh, copies and we write in the copies. I haven't done this before. Yeah, so. absolutely, great question. Yeah. So what'll happen is I think, so Jeff is gonna put a whole bunch of stuff in uh, the Google the Drive Google by right. uh, by May 15th, yeah. and then Michelle actually has, there's mm -hmm. a form that I think we've used through Desi mm -hmm. that we'll all have. We can probably get that in the folder sooner rather than later so you can look it's, at it and it's familiarize. It's in there already, okay. even yeah. better. You just complete that. If you um, and download then, it, don't have a paper form? Or and then you it? submit them. I would ask you to submit them to me, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, you can send them to Michelle and or both of us. Um, paper form in the packet. Okay. Yes, but the, yes, and paper forms here. But if you could get, so what I'd like to do is get the final copy by June 1st, because what I'll do is I'll take and, like I did last year, just take and do like averages of the rating okay. scales. So that'll give me enough time to make sure I do that. Um, and then what we did last year was we didn't read any of the comments. We just opened it up. So if there's any, you can put the comments in there. They're public mm -hmm. records. Okay. But we didn't take the time to read everyone's comments. So last year what we did is if we opened it up, if somebody wanted to share something great, um, and if they didn't, again, it's public record. So mm -hmm. does that sound okay as a process? Okay. Yeah. Sounds good? Okay. I, have a, I just have a question. Yes. We can electronically fill this out and send it to you. That would be outstanding. Okay. Um, Yes. Yeah. I Electronically just, fill it out and send it to Chris. Yes. So then, or you can send it. I would say send it. If Michelle, how have we done in the past? Both of us, or do you want it to go to you? How about both of us? Between the two of us, we'll make sure it happens. So just on that, everybody just needs to make a copy of the document because there's only one document. So if we all go in and oh, try yes. to edit it, good point. Then don't don't all, do it there. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to make a copy of it. Um, I'm going to give Chris a Google tutorial. <laughs> I was say, anyone, two things I anyone needs <laughs> one later? Um, just make a note of that because you'll go in and all your stuff will be gone. So. Thank you. Awesome. So June 1st, thanks. Yes. Auditor's report. John, you want to bring up the auditors, please? Thank you. Um, so my name is Jennifer Cook and I am the signing director on the audit engagement. Um, I did um, pass around the presentation, so I'm just going to go through each of these pages. Um, so first off, I just wanted to talk about the terms of the engagement and what we were engaged to do, um, which is express an opinion on the financial statements, that they're presented in accordance with GAAP, um, and provide reasonable assurance that they're free from misstatements. Express an opinion in, in, in a relation opinion on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards express an opinion on the compliance related to major, major programs, provide a report on internal control over financial reporting and compliance with laws and regulations, provide a report on internal control over compliance related to the mo major programs, and also um, provide a management letter based on any findings that may come up during the audit process. So just um, on page five, the executive summary, just to, um, you have, you've received a full copy of the financial statements, which were issued on April 1st. Um, we issued an unmodified opinion. Um, and I did want to draw attention to, you will notice a restatement in the financials, and that's related to the implementation of GASB 84. Um, and that's bringing your previously reported agency funds um, to, um, they all went to non-major governmental funds. Um, the majority of those relate to the student activity funds. Next on page six is just a highlight of the statement of net position. Um, a few things that I want to bring up is the unrestricted deficit at the end of fiscal year 2021 was 118 million. Um, as I've highlighted below, the, the cause of this deficit relates to the OPEB liability and pension liability. 
Um, OPEB specifically, um, that liability itself increased $30 million this year um, as a result of two factors, changes in assumptions related to calculation of claims, but also the discount rate. Um, because of the funding level currently in the OPEB trust, um, it requires that it's, it's reported at a blended rate, and because of the funding level, um, it drives the rate rate down currently, which is driving your um, liability up. Um, as you can see in the footnote of the financials, um, changing that discount rate, whether through funding or improved investment performance, you can see how, how quickly um, the liability can change from one way to another and, and how significant these assumptions are on the projection of that liability. Um, the net pension liability did decrease by $2 million this year, and that was a result of investment performance in the retirement system. The next page on page seven is governmental funds. Um, that's where your general fund reported. Um, there are currently three other major funds, which is the Circuit Breaker Fund, the Hanson Middle School HVAC Fund, which currently is showing a deficit, and that's the result of bans. So until those bans get paid off or converted to long-term debt, they, uh, it will show a deficit. The other new fund is the COVID-19 fund, um, and that deficit is a result of the CRF funding. Um, so I believe as of today, you can correct me if I'm wrong, all the funds that have been requested through Whitman and Hanson have been received. But as of June 30th, 2021, there is a deficit showing. Next is required communications. You would have received a formal letter on this as well, but I just want to highlight a few items. Uh, significant accounting policies, management is responsible for these, and these are outlined in note two. Um, we, had notes, we noted no significant or unusual transactions identified. The significant accounting estimates, as discussed, are pension and OPEB, um, as well as the estimated useful life uh, of fixed assets. Next is significant disclosures. Um, we've determined that disclosures are neutral, consistent, and clear. Uh, there was no difficulties encountered during the audit process. Um, we did not have any past or corrected audit adjustments. Um, management did provide a management representation letter. Um, we had no other consultations with other accountants um, and no other significant issues that were um, encountered during the audit process. So as discussed earlier, another report um, is GAO, or it's sometimes referred to as the Yellow Book Report, and that is our report on internal controls over financial reporting and compliance with laws and regulations. So we did not have any findings that rose to a material weakness or significant deficiency that would be required to be reported, um, and we did not have any non-compliance with laws and regulations. The next page um, relates to the OMB report. So this is your federal report. Um, currently, I mean, at the end of fiscal year 2021, there was $2.8 million in federal spending, um, which was, is a, a large increase from the prior year, specifically related to CR funding that did come in, as well as the ESSER funding um, through the student stabilization, educational funds. Sorry. So the two major programs that we tested this year was the Special Education Cluster and the Education Stabilization Fund. We did not have any findings related to the Education Stabilization Fund. Um, we did have one finding related to Special Education Cluster, which resulted in a qualified opinion and material weakness. Um, I just want to clarify that the, the costs were allowable. Um, however, they were outside of the, the period of the grant, um, but the costs were allowable. Uh, management has appropriately responded and changed control surrounding to ensure that does not happen going forward. Lastly, um, other matters we wanted to bring, we've discussed with management as well, the upcoming standard for GASB 87 for leases and what's going to be required in the evaluation of those leases. Um, so management is in the process of evaluating those, um, and that'll be implemented for fiscal year 2022. So I know I went through a lot of information fast, so I'll open it up for questions. <laughs> Any questions for anyone? Okay. Fred, you're good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. I could be Yeah, no, I know. So it'll be so. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. John, treasurer and OPEB, please. Sure. Uh, Good evening. I'm going to be very brief. Um, just a few highlights of the past year. Um, the district maintains a very strong debt position. We've got five years left on this building. The last payment is January 1st, 2027. And then this will be complete, 
completely paid for and you can have a bond burning party. I can't hear a yeah. word. George, can you fix the mic, please? No. We got it, Fred. Thanks. The mic's on. Just move it a little closer, please. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> you tell me. A little closer. Should I speak louder? There you go. Closer. Okay. Yep. Um, the, other, the only other project we have a bo um, borrowing authorization for, actually, um, is the HVAC project for a million sixty-five thousand. That's out on a short, short-term bond right now, um, and we'll be paying that off over the next couple of years. And we also have the Whitman Middle School feasibility study that we have not borrowed any money on for that yet. And I, I'm not even sure if that's still in the works, but yes. um, that's there when we need it. And then at the end of the year, our cash position was pretty much the same as it was the prior couple fiscal years, so that's good. And that is all I have. Any questions from the committee? Do okay. we have, I'm sorry. Yep, do, go ahead. Do we have documents in our packet in relate to no, this No, these report? are just my notes. Uh, I, I, I did, these are just my it's notes. This. No. No. no, just no. his notes. Okay. If we need something done, we'll, we'll get it to you. We'll okay. Sure it in packet. No, just, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kate Canny. I'm with Public Agency Retirement Services. Uh, we are a partner with the Plymouth County OPEB Trust Program, so we manage your OPEB account. And uh, the document that you hold, held up just a moment ago is our presentation that I think was included electronically in your packet, but I'm old school and I <laughs> like to be able to have notes with in front of me. Uh, some of these faces are not familiar from when we started this program, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on our program, just to catch everybody up. Uh, in uh, 2015, the Plymouth County uh, Commissioners uh, approached my company, PARS, to ask them to partner with them to establish an OPEB trust program. And this would be to help communities, regional school districts, and special school districts in the counties of Plymouth, Bristol, Barnstable, and Norfolk address their OPEB liabilities. Uh, as your auditor spoke briefly, she gave you some information about your OPEB liability. So this program brought together a couple of groups. Plymouth County acts as the sponsor. PARS, we act as the uh, plan ad trust administrator, uh, plan administrator and consultant. So we do the day-to-day -day work. Um, we assist John and David with the management of your OPUB trust. And U.S. Bank serves as your trustee, a co-trustee and a co-custodian. Very important roles. They are a co-fiduciary with David. Uh, their goals are not only to invest the funds, to, but to make sure that these funds are being held and managed in the best interest of your beneficiaries. Your beneficiaries are your retirees. They're also your current employees and your future employees. So that's, um, that's an important role that they serve. We also have the Plymouth County OPEB Trust Investment Committee. That is an, a group that is duly elected from the membership of the OPEB Trust Program. The Plymouth County Treasurer, Thomas O'Brien, serves as the chair of the committee. And then there are four additional members um, who serve on the uh, committee. Aaron Orcutt from Cape Cod Tech serves on the committee. John Foster from the town of Wareham. Uh, James Downey from uh, Quincy College. And Arthur Thurbatistini, who's a selectman from Middleborough. Um, every agency is open to putting up a member uh, of their agency for uh, election onto the committee, if they so choose. Uh, we have, um, on the next page, it shows you the names of the investment committee meeting. I'd like to actually uh, point out a correction. After this booklet was printed, we moved the next investment committee and general membership meeting to May 10th. I'm going to be sending John um, information about that. Why you might be interested in attending that, that will be at 9 o'clock in the morning at Treasurer O'Brien's office. This will be an opportunity to meet with the portfolio manager, Dennis Mullins. He's gonna come in, he's gonna talk about the portfolio, how it's designed, how it's performing. And also these are very um, interesting times as far as investment goes. The market's been very volatile. We're coming off of COVID into some very dramatic world events and inflation. So he will be taking that um, into account and kind of addressing those um, questions and aspects. And I'd encourage anybody interested to join us that day. 
PCOT has grown from 2015 to 31 members. You notice on page four, um, some of your colleagues, uh, colleague districts have joined as well. Uh, there are 11 school districts participating in the PCOT program. On page five, this is a summary of Whitman Hansen's participation in the program. On October 14th, 2015, the school board voted to adopt the program and enter into the um, investing with PCOT. You selected the original trust, which is a growth portfolio. That's a 75, 25% equity fixed income portfolio. It was the original portfolio and the only one available at the time. Uh, currently, all of our 31 members are still in the original portfolio. The plan administrator is your treasurer, Mr. Leary, and our plan contact we uh, have as Mr. Stanbrook. An initial contribution was made in September of 2016 of $100,000. Additional contributions have been made totaling $75,000. So all in contributions have been $175,000. You have not requested any disbursements. Disbursements are reimbursement for retiree health care. We manage that for you at any time that you want to reimburse yourself for any health care related costs for retirees. You may access funds in your account, but you haven't asked to do that. Um, expenses, that is the cost for you to participate in this program. So since your first contribution in September 2016, all in the school district has paid $2,772 to participate. That's not a month, not a year. That's the entire amount of funds you've paid. Your return of investment has been $105,513. So um, as of February 28th, 2022, I apologize for not having the March 31st numbers, but those will not actually be available until the 18th of this month. Uh, so as of March, uh, February 28, 2022, your account balance was 277,742. Page six actually shows you your contribution and if you were taking them, your disbursement history. So you'll see on two charts, it'll show you uh, contributions that you've made. You made contributions in fiscal years 17, 18, and 19. Um, you did not request any disbursements. So it just shows you a side by side, the impact of investing and contributions on your account. Um, I find these charts become a little more dynamic and interesting as your tenure in the program continues. Investment performance as of February 28, 22, uh, one year, your one year return was 5.04%. Your three year return has been 11.23%. So that's annualized returns. So for the three years, and then you, for your five year return, that's 10.48%. And then an important thing is we have run a pooled program. So we invest all the assets of all 31 members together. This allows us to drive down our fees and keep them low. When you joined our program, our investment assets under management fee was 51 basis points. And a basis, uh, a basis point is 1% of 1%. Uh, because we've been able to grow the fund through memberships increasing, contributions, and investment earnings, the fund actually on February 28th was $41 million. Um, we've been able to lower those uh, fees down to 38 basis points. Um, in the back of the report is an overview of the portfolio. I'm not the portfolio manager, so I really don't typically speak to that, um, but I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Questions from me, Steve? Would you give me that percentage split again that you said earlier? Of your portfolio? Yes. You, you have a, your equity position is 75% and your fixed income position is 25%. Okay. Thank you. Now, we do have three other portfolios that have been developed since. One is an aggressive growth. That's an 80% equity position. We have a, con a balanced uh, portfolio, which is a 60% yes. equity position and a conservative, which is a 40% equity position. Um, you are available to change your portfolio at any time. There is not a cost associated with it. I ask one favor of you that when you decide to make that decision or discussion, that that's an appropriate time for a meeting with a portfolio manager. You always want to make sure your portfolio switch is in keeping with both short-term rationale and long-term investment goals. I think a lot of people get worried about the coming year. Absolutely. And you don't want to be foolish, but you want to be mindful. So as you noticed, um, our return of investment for the past year was about 5.4%. Mm -hmm. COVID, we had an unbelievable bump. It was our 
portfolio over that time period was re returning about 25 percent. No, none of us predicted that. Um, in March of 2020, April 2020, we were looking at a down market. It recovered strong and then some. But we are looking with rates of inflation and think about a 4 percent return on our portfolio this year. Now, the portfolio itself is only designed to return you 6.6 percent over 30 years. We've built this portfolio to capture the highs and mitigate the lows as best we can. But um, if the school committee would be more comfortable in a 60-40 or a 40-60, that's definitely something to consider. However, as your auditor would tell you, when you lower your equity position, you're lowering your re return of investment, that will impact, impact your discount rate, which could impact your unfunded low liability. Something to think about, but these are all things to take into consideration. Mr. Stanbrook really stands as a uh, go-to guy for everything financial. We found out so, so much stuff that's still racking our head, so um, we'll, we will be mindful, and, and I appreciate your time. I think Don had a question. Yeah. Um, so there's 31 um, government entities mm -hmm. that are part of this plan, and you said the total value of all of those is at 41 million? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I'm sure you can't disclose what each entity has for balances, but one could guess. There, so I, 31. We have entities, designed a program that million. helps every agency because we—that's what we want to do—is provide agencies that have small assets and agencies that have large assets. Mm -hmm. um, you are not our smallest asset level mm -hmm. by far, um, but uh, we do have an agency that has just under five million dollars. Um, you are a regional school district. You have a challenge that um, special districts that have revenue sources and municipalities don't have is that your ability to fund your OPEP trust comes from funding a line item in your budget. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that has to be approved by your member town. So that is your revenue source, and that's where you're allocating the funds. So that's, it's a little bit of a challenge for school districts. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> Moving on, um, transportation. John, if you want to step up, uh, let me just give you a little bit of history. Um, in February, I presented uh, uh, a presentation to the school committee on, on transportation, non mandated transportation. From that meeting, uh, members of, of our community said, hey, this doesn't make much sense uh, when we, the costs, if we cut non mandated transportation, um, we're almost as equal to the cost of busing everyone. So, Ms. Galvin, I'll give you, and Mr. Kane, really dug hard deep to try to come up with a, a theorem that would work for us and got us thinking. We presented that to, to Desi. We had uh, two, I think, very insightful, spirited conversations with Jay Sullivan and, 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 and Christine uh, from Desi. I had a great conversation um, with the men from Mars, the Mass Association of Regional Schools, and they said, you know, have you ever looked at busing and mileage? And Chris and I had a conversation about, you know, when you take an Uber, you pay so much for a, to go from point A to point B, and if it's point A to point B, which is 10 miles further, the Uber charges you more. Um, so we tasked John to, to look at that mileage piece, and he, he spent quite a bit of time of, of analyzing every student, where they live, and luckily we have a good software system to, allocate, to pinpoint every student, and he came up with a theory uh, on mileage and transportation for mandated transportation and mileage. The goal of this group and the goal of the citizens and, and the goal of the committee is to try to maximize the amount of state money we could get in reimbursement. And I think we found a solution. Um, we ran the solution by Jay Sullivan. Jay actually said, John, you could do it easier. Here's a different way. So John did it that way. And that methodology is accepted by the state. And retroactively, retroacted for fiscal 22. So when we do our reimbursements in, Ju in July, we can use this method. And a FinCom member actually asked the question if we could look into fiscal 21 and make that amendment. Jay said yes. Now, I don't know what that means yet, so I don't want to disclose numbers. But Jay has John working on fiscal 21's actuals to see what we can get for reimbursement. So thank you, Ms. Otina, for, for throwing that suggestion out there. It doesn't he hesitate to ask. And he said yes. So we're working on that. 
Uh, we have to get that in by the end of the month. But I can't share with committee what that's going to be, and I don't want to speculate um, to to you know put a to put a wrinkle in what we're talking about tonight. But thank you for asking the question. We asked, we were granted that, and we'll have more information come the May meeting. So John, crunch some numbers, and I think this is positive for the district and for both communities in that we can actually get more mandated reimbursables and we also cut the cost of non-mandated busing um, tremendously. So John, if you wanna go with what you did, and, um, and I just wanna, again, publicly thank Mr. Galvin, Mr. Lamantina, Mr. Evans, Ms. Otina, Mr. Kane, Mr. Heineman, all the folks who, who kinda threw different ideas out there to, uh, to, to, to have us look through a different lens. And again, the men from Mars for suggesting that, because that was something that has never come across. And digging in a little bit deeper, I asked Mr. Tuffy, I said, John, you were the regional superintendent in Silver Lake. Did you use per pupil, whatever? He goes, that's what's the, the going piece out in, in, the, in the Commonwealth, per, per pupil for reimbursables through the state. Mileage isn't used that much, and that might be something we might be sharing with our, our peers to say, have you looked at the mileage? It might be better for you, um, and you can get more state money instead of more local money. So John, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, so this is um, this is the sheet that I'm going to be reading off of. It's just it looks like that. It's the top of it. It says Whitman Hanson Regional School District, FY23 budget comparison. Um, the the top part is the budget that was uh, passed back on March 16th, uh, 58 million 492 31412. Um, John, and can you speak up just a little bit? Right to the sure. Microphone. Right. Yep. I'll, I'll lean. I'll lean. <laughs> um, yeah, we can so uh, I'll just say that again. It's the uh, it's the document that is uh, entitled Whitman Hanson Regional School District FY23 budget comparisons. At the top of it is how the budget was voted in back on March 16th. The budget was 58 million 492. Again, I'm going to round numbers off. The town of Whitman's assessment was 17.797, um, and the the components of that were the operating assessment the non-mandated transportation and the capital assessment on there um, and then Hanson's assessment is also there 13.9 with uh, the breakdown of the operating Fred is that our can you hear or not me know Fred uh, I hear it I just don't see his document in the drive it was, uh, I don't know if it was in the drive did you email did anyone get it uh, yeah this one I think was in I got was it, it in the drive Michelle or was it sent I don't see it in the drive, but I know you, I thought you sent it. Yesterday. It was in yesterday, it was in the packet. It's in the packet. So it's in your paper packet. Hold on one second. We can't give. Yeah, it's under budget FY23. Yeah. Financial budget documents, budget FY23. There you go. It's right there. Fred, you got that? Thank you. Budget FY23, there are two documents. One is uh units general fund form of budget and the other one is assess change assessment change that, and that one that's it that yeah one that excel file fred that's the one fy23 assess changes okay so the excel yep yeah and fred i just sent you a picture of it too i did too there you go okay, <laughs> fred, you got it like five times now <laughs> phone's blown up yeah. nope no problem no problem go ahead sorry John. okay okay uh so the second part is um, with a, um, a FY23 mile method, uh, that's what I'm trying to think of a name to call the mileage mm -hmm. method. I'm calling it mile method. Um, and with the state reimbursement with the new mile method at 90%. So the budget hasn't changed. It's 58,492,000. Uh, the town of Whitman's assessment would John, be- John, can I stop you right there? Sure. This has not been voted, folks. No, it, it has not. I had John run these just so you can see the numbers so that you can make an informed decision because we do have to make a change to the assessment if because I think it's we're using a mileage method so something's going to have to change but it's up to the committee and how they want to do it but I had John run these numbers for you yeah it may be said another way so the non-mandated lines certainly need to change correct yep. um, and then when it comes to the overall budget which is the next discussion item overall assessment right the overall budget yep. but we have a non-balanced budget yep. So right, so now we're going to have more revenue coming in, mm -hmm. and when we look at our total budget that was previously voted, Correct. we have more revenue coming in than expense. So we have to do something with that. So that may either translate to changing the assessments or something, but we shouldn't have, we shouldn't leave a budget 
where we knowingly have more revenue than expense coming yeah. in because basically all we're doing is putting money in ENT. We're not, we're not, we don't have a balanced budget, so to speak. So, so I just wanted to put that out there too. Very important. Yes, I agree because that yeah. doesn't presume right. anything. Right. I'm, but sorry. it certainly gives the numbers. I should have stated the assumption on the page. On the page. <coughs> That's exactly it. You're right. right. I'm sorry about that. Um, it, it assumes that the savings in transportation and non-mandated and in, in, in the operation part of it, operational assessment, um, gets passed on, and th this this will be the amount if it was to, pa to be passed on completely to the towns. So um, the town of Whitman's assessment would be 17.3 million. Again, rounding the numbers off, um, the operating assessment would be 16,741. The non-mandated transportation cost would be 216 uh, under the new method. Capital assessments would stay the same. For the town of Hanson, the uh, assessment. Uh, total assessment would be 13,782,199. Uh, the operating assessment would be 13,245. Uh, the non-mandated transportation would be 55,234, and then the capital assessments would stay the same. It doesn't have anything that um, that's not impacted at all. This is just transportation related. So uh, down the bottom, the difference between the two, um, the, act, the overall budget doesn't change at all. It stays the same at 58, 492. 31412. Uh, the town of Whitman's assessment would go down a total of 420,603.92 if it was all passed through. And the town of Hanson's assessment would go down $163,001.20 if it was all passed through. And it's kind of a breakdown of where those numbers come from. So I can keep going or. Is anyone. Well, no, 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 I mean, no, no, no. Yeah, I don't know if there's <laughs> questions, but I think. Um, if we can kind of keep it in two pieces, mm -hmm. just so we can kind of keep it on the rails, so to speak. Yeah. So I think the first part of the conversation is around the methodology, mm -hmm. what was done, um, the potential change to a mileage-based uh, methodology, the fact that Desi approved. So if we can stay on that part, and yes. then the next item on the agenda is that we can have the budget conversation, okay, now what do we do now? So any questions on the methodology, what we're doing on the methodology, why, Chris? Um. So just to be clear, we haven't changed the criteria for non-mandated or anything right. like that, right? It's right. All, all, everything's the same. Those services have yep. not changed. Not at all. Thank you. The only difference is the, the cost that was being calculated for a mandated and a non-mandated student, which was the same, is now very different. Mm -hmm. So the, like Jeff said, the person that lives very far away, there is now a very different cost than the person that lives close mm -hmm. by. And we can build a state for that. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I had someone over here first, Steve, and then. So um, last week when we met as the budget subcommittee, and yes. I know we didn't approve our minutes with that yet. Um, David's been doing yeoman's work. Oh, we did. Minutes. We did that one. We did approve them. Yeah, they're good. You see, we went through those so fast. Okay, <laughs> let's start. Um, I know we were shown first of all two n different numbers on the non-mandated, and what kind of threw me back was I didn't understand the first one. This gives me clarity in looking at it and saying, hey, that's a significant savings. But can John speak to how he got that, like, you know, he told us the mileage or whatever. Can we speak to that a little bit to explain that so folks know that it, it wasn't, it was done a, a, a certain way? Do you know the one? Yeah, 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 you can, you can, yeah. Go ahead. So, well, well, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So hold on. So that. yeah, no, never mind. <laughs> I don't mean to try. So, try going um, so yeah. So I think. Um, so John, I think maybe Steve's just looking to share a little bit more about the process in terms of the actual methodology itself, just a little bit. So, you know, to David's point, this was something that we did publicly through the budget subcommittee. We met a number of times throughout the course of March with folks participating with Desi. So that was certainly a step that was taken. But Steve, I mean, are you looking to share a little bit more about? how what that mileage basis yeah i mean you know what 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 did they come up with that that made the difference yeah so, so to speak. just to uh, i took every single student and found out their distance from the school that they go to mm -hmm. and then used that number uh to come up with a mileage total and then took that mileage and, and split it out between mandated and non-mandated i'm trying to it was a lot of math in yeah. between, but yeah. that's what it was. So the, every single student's distance uh, uh, to the school was I, That's what I figured out. Yeah, I, I want to make sure that everyone sure. You know, knows that. And, and it was steps, obviously. And, and, and okay. we ran it by uh, Desi, and they were that's okay right. with that. They, 
My question was kind of along the same lines. Um, not so much the process, but how do we, like, did Desi give you, this is the financial number per mile? Like, right, like when you, I, I, I'm just, I'm thinking of people who travel for work and have to fill up mileage, for, right? So, so how do we get to that number? And I'm sorry if you if what you just said no. answers that. That's a good question. That's a good question. I, I, I sent him. The, there's a sheet that I how I, I don't know if you got it or not. You may not have gotten it, but I, 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 I sent Desi the sheet of how I calculated it, the number of students and the number of miles, and that's when, uh, like Mr. Simonic said, they came back with a much easier way to do it than with what I sent them, um, and I adopted the method that they that they told me to do. So it's it was um, it's taking the total miles from school. And then dividing, uh, dividing it into mandated and non-mandated. So every student has a mileage. So, for example, I'm one, I live one mile from school. You live two miles from school. Uh, the chair lives three miles from school. That's six miles, one plus two plus three. Yep. And then you total all that up and you get a <coughs> mileage. And then we break that mileage up between non-mandated and mandated. So uh, the, our rules for non-mandated and mandated haven't changed. Okay. We just get the breakout of mileage between those two. And then use those numbers to calculate the... The cost per student mile. I've been fighting of trying to come up with what to call it specifically, but that that's what it would be. Right. Okay. Because I guess for me, it's you know, if you're looking at a reduction of four hundred thousand dollars, give or take, right? I think that's important that we know. And you were getting to this point that there was a process. It's not just thrown yes. out there. Um, thank you. So it, yeah, it's it's um, it's the budget hasn't changed on the on the district's end. It's just where there's more mandated busing. Um, under the mileage method that we can apply for and get reimbursement. So we're going to be getting more revenue from the state. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. David? Yeah, I just kind of want to add a little bit to what Steve and John were saying. Um, so basically, uh, John Galvin and Sean Kane uh, approached the budget subcommittee early in March with an idea on how to uh, reassess how our busing methodology works with the hope that it would become more eligible for state reimbursement over time, which would save dis the district and both towns uh, money in the long run. Uh, we've been working through it. We met approximately probably six or seven times in March. Um, we had several different meetings. We met with uh, Desi two or three times. We uh, Jeff had an interview or a meeting with March, uh, Mars. And um, basically, long story short, is the methodology that Galvin and uh, Sean Kane uh, provided was not necessarily going to be eligible to be approved by Desi. However, after further conversation with Desi, we realized that we could do a mileage-based method of assessment Therefore, that would be approved by DESE, and it wouldn't take away any services in, in terms of non-mandated or mandated uh, busing, or eligible or non-eligible, depending on the terminology. Uh, so what we ended up doing is we had further meetings to talk about the, uh, the assessment. We decided on a mileage-based assessment. And again, like John had already said, um, it was eligible for more state reimbursement, which would save us money in the long run. So we had further discussions on how that would be properly implemented. And then John reached out to Desi, John Stanbrook reached out to Desi to make sure that would be approved. Obviously, as John uh, just said, uh, you know, he sent the paperwork over to see if that would be okay. Desi provided um, an even more helpful answer on how to calculate the numbers. From there, we met back up as a budget subcommittee, went over the methodology. Um, you can say the uh, numbers and the savings. I'm pretty sure it was approximately over 300,000 in savings for the town of Whitman, and it was a little bit lower for Hanson. Um, so that, I mean, that's basically where we came at. Uh, John Galvin, Sean came, uh, had an idea. We discussed it. We decided to uh, work through it. We found a methodology that was eligible through DESE that would make us more eligible for state reimbursement without taking away any services, and that's kind of how we got to where we're at now, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Well done. I think the only two comments I would add briefly is um, one, the reimbursement. Re so actually, first, probably one of the more meaningful things with this is this is a permanent change. So this isn't a one-year change because now that we've changed the methodology, that eligible, mandated, reimbursable cost will be a permanent fixture of the budget or budget process going forward. So that's really good. Um, the other item that we just have to pay attention to because it is a variable is the reimbursement rate, right? So even though we've added to the pool, which is wonderful through that collaborative process of eligible reimbursements, we all have to understand that it's still always subject to appropriation, appropriation and that amount changes. So right now we're using 90%. Hopefully we can get 90, hopefully we can get 100% like we should. Um, but 
regardless, you know, the, the, the number is bigger. So even if it's a smaller percent, percentage, it's still big, a big deal. But one of the things we'll all have to watch, because if we look at these numbers next year or five years from now, and all of a sudden, like, hey, what happened to those, that reimbursable rate? It could be a function of, hopefully, God willing, the reimbursement rate's going up a little, or it could be the reimbursement rate's going down a little. So, higher, more recent years. Cool. Yeah, so we just have, it's just something to watch. But, but overall, I think that was essentially what we wanted to communicate. Any other questions? I just have a, yeah. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but the, do you have somewhere a document that you can share with us on the mileage, like the calculation piece? If that yes. makes, I, and if yeah. it's something, you, I, I don't want to make him have to, I don't want to have no, to make you have, make another no, document. I'm just interested to see how yeah. it, it played out. I, I, um, yeah, I have it right here. <laughs> Great. It's going to come back. Thank I don't you. want to That's blizzard we'll, you with paper, though. We'll but. make sure that it's okay. highlighted. He sees it in something. the streams. Right. 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 No. And, and that's the only thing that didn't change. John still works nine days a week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 24, 24 yeah. hours a day. So do you want to talk about the legal piece a little yeah. bit? Yeah, so John, hang up there just for a minute. So in that process of talking about this, we had a discussion around how this is submitted. And, you know, because in our regional uh, agreement, what we have found is that their regional agreement is mucky and messy in certain spots. And there's different language that we is in there that for the past 30 years we necessarily haven't followed. So the town of Whitman submitted a, a letter from their council. We submitted that <coughs> letter to Andy Waugh. Chris and I had a couple of conversations with Andy. I submitted, Chris dug some de uh, digging in into town reports uh, from the 90s. I then submitted to Andy every assessment from 2001 to 2022. And what we found in those assessments is that it's been consistent we've we send the towns an operating assessment a non-mandated busing assessment and a capital assessment sometimes it has changed we used to send whitman a, a crossing guards assessment as well um, whatever based on what our council has said that process is the process we should continue to use but we really need to start looking at the regional agreement so that we can get it clear from both communities what this process will mean in that also that that conversation with andy based on those assessments we've seen an 80 20 split or a per pupil really of the non-mandated piece it wasn't broken into a 60 40 or the general operating assessment that we have followed in the regional agreement it has really been by the pupil and it was really almost an, a direct 80 20 split for the past 30 years i can document from 2001 on uh chris saw the original in 92 where it was for split Hanson. up like yeah, that. for Hanson. Yep. For, for Hanson. So, so that would be my recommendation to the committee as we move forward, follow the, the process that we have had. It's uh, a little bit different than what Whitman Council has, has alluded to. Um, but we went with our council too, and that's what I'm submitting. Both the attorney letters are, are in your packets, and I know you both reviewed those. But the comment from Andy is, you know, follow your process. It has been past practice, and you really need to look at the regional agreement. Yeah, and so just the only part I would add to that, um, I think there was a, you all have a copy of the letter from Andy, but there was a piece in there where he did talk about um, the boards of selectmen having that uh, overall authority of the town meeting warrant and articles. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and Andy was very clear, you know, the, the agreement, like if you read that transportation language, it's, it's messy. There's one line that says one thing, the next line jumps to something else, and the third line, we're not even sure where that came from, or it, whether or not it can be done. But he was very clear, you know, this is something that we should probably clean up, but based on the way we've been doing it, that's fine. And also, um, ultimately, you know, the way the towns decide to handle this is, is within their purview. So for us to say, here's how we've broken it out, and to provide that to the towns, uh, the way we took that previous vote with each of those lines being voted, we had the operating assessment, the line for non-mated busing, and the line for capital. He said that that's fine. Again, if the towns choose to do that differently within uh, the scope of how the Board of Selectmen choose to put that within the Warren article, that's, that is that is up to the towns. Um, the bottom line is, I think, we have an agreement that is, <clears throat> that is not as clear as any of us would like. So that is something that Jeff and I talked, I think just to that point, uh, we both agreed that's something we'd like to put on the school committee agenda right after the May elections. There's no sense in trying to start a regional agreement now when we have elections that are ongoing and then have a conversation about how do we clean that up and how do we move that forward. So I think those were the two big points on the legal update.
questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, Chris. So I know we've talked recently about the school committee having the authority to present their budget to the towns right and, and, turn, and how it appears on the warrant are we is this conflicting with yeah that? yeah so i think yeah and i think um yes so i think the way that andy described it to us was um it is and there's and i you know i'm not an attorney we can bring them back <laughs> if we want to do that sometime but the i think the general concept was the spirit of the law and it not even spirit i think it's explicitly stated is that for a regional school district essentially the towns can 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 agree to fund it or not right and so that's where it gets a little mm -hmm. murky when you start breaking out some of these pieces because of our regional agreement and because of the way we <coughs> handled this yep. it, it's it gets really messy really fast so that, but um, just to go back to when jay sullivan was making those comments about yep. he was budget. yes so he was, was but he didn't have our regional agreement in yeah. front of him okay <laughs> with sure. the language in there pertaining yep. to some of this and he didn't have this is how we've done it for mm -hmm. the last x year so mm -hmm. and he also said he wasn't an attorney so sure. yep. uh, that's the hard part it's I, I don't think anyone has a clear the best way to make this clear would be to take the regional agreement and spell out in very clear language exactly what we want to all happen mm -hmm. that would be the way to do mm -hmm. it sure. yep. but yes if we know that presenting it the way we have in the past with a separate line for non-mandating as jay and christine said may present an inequity because one town can vote down one line and another town can approve it the non-mandated piece why wouldn't we as a committee make a decision to not follow past practice and to put one budget line item to both towns and then they vote one line yep. yes or no the committee can do whatever it wants. We're just sharing the opinion of council. Right. And it's right. our council, not, as Jay said, not I, an attorney. I agree. But I believe Jay was saying Mass General Law says a regional school district provides one budget number to a town. They can say yes or no. And, and we decide what goes in that line item for that one line item of the budget. I, yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I understand what Don's saying. I think that, and I agree with that, but I'm wondering if just this year, because of the change, that to see the difference between years is important to the, two the people of the towns, mm -hmm. to see that we're making a difference mm -hmm. and that we're working on it, but then next year to put it all in one. And I just, I, you know, it's just a matter of seeing it. You know, the townspeople seeing, look, this is what we did. Look at the money we just saved you, you know, and as a separate line that you have that. But then I agree with Dawn that it should be one, one package in there. But for this year, I'd really like to leave it as the two lines. That's just my, that's just my opinion. Chris? Yeah, I just want to follow up. Um, was Andy privy to our discussions with Jay Sullivan? And yeah, we gave him a video. Okay. Yeah, he watched right. the video. So he still made his, his mm -hmm. opinion based on, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for the committee? And otherwise I see people lined up. So. I just have a, to Don's point too, I don't disagree. My only worry is because we often have such a difficult time with the budget, putting these numbers in and it being rejected. And then we as the committee have to like buses or this right and i think to beth's point showing i think and we talked about this in policy subcommittee educating the people of the community and saying this is how we've done it but moving forward this isn't how we're going to do it this year we've saved you x amount of dollars then we can do what i think putting it all in one but i think to do it right now i i concur with don um excuse me with beth that i i don't know that it's the best idea to do for right now just because of the diff because of what we've done to make it different yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes, Fred. Uh, and I'm sure you perhaps, Mr. Stanbrook, uh, but we are giving one budget item and one assessment to the town. The difference is, is how we break it out. Mm -hmm. So we're breaking it out after the operating assessment, but we're still giving one number mm -hmm. and we're allowing the town to see what that difference is. I mean, I would be in favor of uh, removing the uh, difference, so to speak, recertifying our budget, you know, to reflect those savings. Uh, 
putting those savings into those particular line items. So hang on, Frank, because the next item is going to be budget. So right now we're just talking about, I think, the legality, and then and then you can do yes. what you want to do. Um, but okay. hang on. So uh, did you have? Yes. Um, I, okay, I think Don. Yeah. Yeah, through you, Chair. Yeah. Maybe to Fred, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. If we have an operating assessment to the towns and we have a non mandating, man, non mandated busing line to the towns, if one of those is rejected, then our entire budget's rejected. Is that correct? I want to clarify. Um, one of those is rejected, our entire like, I guess we'd have to post that up. To yeah, I think that's an important question to find out because that's what it seems like we are voting or is presented to us tonight. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think the other point to point out, and because I don't know if you understand that, and I'm not sure this is where you're going, but if you're suggesting that all of the school costs get put into the operating assessment line, mm -hmm. then that does change the financial implication as to how it's been handled for the last many years, right? Because the operating assessment is going to be more of that 60-40. And really the way, again, whether I agree with it or not, the way it's been handled, that non-mandated transportation line has been basically a per town cost. It's been handled like a special operating cost. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the danger with saying, hey, it's all going to go in a line. It's no longer a special operating cost. It's no longer a cost per town. It's now just a district-wide cost, which, right. again, in reviewing um, the documents, that's the issue. Um, yeah, no. which I think we clearly support the busing. I think to your point, Hillary, you know, we're not at all saying we're going to take away busing or anything at this point. It's just a matter of where do we place that in, mm -hmm. in right. line. Yeah. Sorry. Hillary, and then I really yeah. want to get Sorry, to but to your, but to your point, Chris, I think that, you know, coming from Hanson, I think that what Chris kind of said is going to ruffle a lot of feathers where right now we're doing a per pupil and it is essentially an 80-20. And if we put it on a line item at 6040, and I don't know how that would go over in Hanson, considering still kind of, you know, we have to figure out the statutory method, but you know what I'm saying? And I, I don't know that I want to put people in that position where, you know, we've are, we, you, we all were there when the methodology changed for, you know, to go to statutory. And I just don't know that that would be the best thing to do for the students. I agree, I think buses are important, but you're going to have people who are gonna say, wait a minute, we were doing 80-20, now we're doing 60-40, what is this? And I, I just, I don't, I would like to maybe try to avoid that if we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I agree with you. Mr. Chair. David and then Fred. Uh, I'm just thinking real quick in my head and maybe uh, a good process that we could go about as a committee is when the uh, Regional Agreement Amendment Committee meets again um, the main discussion, I assume, would be uh, relating to the busing methodology. So maybe that's the uh, point where that committee goes and hashes it out and um, creates a updated agreement that would be in line with how we envision um, our busing practices to be in the long-term future, if that makes any sense. So for now, I, mean, I, I personally don't think this is the most ideal way, and I, I know I've been uh, a critic of the regional agreement uh, in the past just by how it's been implemented. Uh, but but I, I personally believe that maybe it might be in our best interest to go about uh, non-mandated busing the way we are right now, um, but I am open for suggestions, but maybe it's better off for us to meet as a regional agreement amendment committee and then add those changes, get them approved, and then go through um, the busing process in line with what the updated agreement would say. So maybe that might be a good way of going about it. Not positive, but it's an idea. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I see some folks waiting. Feel free. Just give us your name and yeah. address. Oh, sorry, Fred. I forgot about you. Fred first. Sorry. Sorry, Fred. I just wanted to, uh, you know, piggyback on Ms. Nippon's uh, statements. Uh, by changing anything right now, we're, we're creating an inequitable situation. The way it's done right now is equitable for both towns. It distributes the cost where they should be distributed and to whom. I should say they should be distributed. And that's fair. And I think both times we feel that that's fair. Uh, you know, as far as the, uh, we do need to do redo our regional agreement. We have a beautiful blueprint already in place and, you know, some great ways to start, so to speak. And I'm sure the men from Mars would be willing to help us uh, finalize that if anything has changed since we had done it a few years back. 
So David, quickly. And just, just real quick. So uh, superintendent, just for clarification, you said over the last 30 years, the way it's been done is about approximately an 80-20 split. I can document from 2001 on. Okay. So, I mean, with that being said, I, my personal opinion is I think that is more of an inequity than it is an, an equity that benefits both towns, which is why, again, my suggestion would be that we need to work on this um, and update our regional agreement. <clears throat> that way we can start implementing um, bus changes or our busing process that reflects the new updated regional agreement because to Chris's point to Jeff's point um, not only is it statutory that was um, done incorrectly a couple years back but now it's also the busing methodology so the, the whole entire constant theme with the regional agreement is that it's been outdated and the way we do things isn't necessarily reflecting what the regional agreement says so therefore we should amend it and update it and then with the new changes we go from there and, and have a continuous transparent process that we've worked on together to move forward and then hopefully through that clarification and the money being saved to the town of Hanson and Whitman <coughs> and the services being implemented at the school district um, that hopefully that would be to uh, our constituency's benefit and they would see the work we put in and from there we can move forward. But that's how I look at it. Yep. And everyone's gonna have, everyone's gonna have different opinions. Yep. Uh, Fred, and I, so Fred, I, yeah, I, I really don't wanna Sorry. go back and forth. But Very brief. Yes. Very brief, this is through you to Mrs. Sandbrook. The charges that we see appear for non-mandated transportation in this chart that are highlighted, the new, new charges, those are reflective of the cost. I just wanna verify that. Yes. Yes. John says yes. Okay. So that is perfectly equitable. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Sean, go ahead. Uh, Sean Kane, 31 Forest Street. Um, I think as, as we come to a, a solution with the transportation dilemma, it's a good thing, you know, and, and I think we need to slow down and, and realize when something is good and when we benefit from it, you know, and, we did some, some work and a lot of people played a role and John Stanbrook did a ton of work and we came out and, and we had a win. You know, so I think it is good that we document that and think about, especially next year, starting early with some budget work, stuff like this, I know it's, it's not always easy and it does take a lot of work um, and it doesn't always pan out the way this did, but if you look at the circuit breaker and, and the, the transportation issue and how much money was kind of saved, it's one of the ways in which we're going to get the budget to work this year. You know, we are in a unique situation where enrollment's declining and we're in a tough situation with the hold harmless and it's very difficult to add services, although we need to add services. So given that frame, finding ways to become more efficient is extremely important. So to be direct about the start of this budget cycle, at the start of this budget cycle, you didn't want to look at the budget. If you remember it wasn't a priority until later in the later in I mean, probably three or four months into the if you were, you were talking about priorities in June you didn't want to talk about budget until say September and I think do that again you know certainly focus on priorities again that was an, an, a, a very helpful process but keep the budget as a priority you know as a as a the five-year plan keep looking at the five-year plan keep trying to surface ways to become more efficient. And I think it can only be helpful. It, it's a lot of work, but that's, we got to win today, I think. And it's one way in which we're gonna potentially fund the budget. If we can do it again next year, I think it's gonna be helpful. So. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Ms. Otina. Uh, Kathleen Otina, Whitman Finance Committee. Uh, first, I wanna thank everyone who was involved with this. Uh, I'd also like to thank the superintendent for hanging in there because uh, you inherited a flawed regional agreement. By the time you retire, Jeff, I think it will be perfect. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> the so. bad news, Jeff, is that it's going to take 10 years for that to happen. <laughs> so you're stuck. Um, but I do want to quote from the regional agreement, Section 5, Transportation. It says, it, this is right from the agreement, school transportation shall be provided by the regional school district and the cost thereof shall be apportioned to the member towns as an operating cost. Sentence number two, the regional school committee shall determine on an annual basis whether or not non-mandated non non busing will be paid for by the regional school district. And that's a key point. You can decide whether you want to pay it or you can decide that you don't want to pay it. If you decide you want to pay it, 
you pay it out of your operating expenses, your operating budget. If you decide not to, sentence number three, if the regional committee decides not to provide non-mandated busing, an article will be presented to the selectman's office of each town for the approval by the voters. The problem I see with that, having an explicit non-mandated busing line item, is that the voters of the town can vote it down. And then how do you get those children who are not eligible for busing bust to the, to the town? And that's, and I sat in on the, or I looked at the Zoom meetings where Christine Lynch said, you've got a problem here if one town says yes and the other town says no, you have an inequity because you can't bust kids from one town and not bust the kids from the other. So I think the danger in splitting out the non-mandated mandated busing costs lies in the fact that there will be possibly a town, maybe both towns say no, put it into your budget. Yes, it folds it back into the 60-40 method, which benefits one town over the other. Um, I've, done the, I've run the numbers, so I know what they are, and I'm not gonna share anything that you don't already have. But you have it in your regional agreement already that you could vote to pay for non-mandated busing, period, and not go into you know, sentence number three, send an article to the town. If you send an article to each town, one or both towns can say no. So I urge you to vote to fund non-mandated busing in your operating cost. Okay. Uh, Randy Lamatina, Selectman, Town of Whitman, liaison to the school district. Uh, first off, I, I think the Everyone that's been involved in this process was involved in the process for one reason. A, a large benefit to being a regional district is state reimbursement for transportation. We have it accomplished that through a lot of butting heads, through numerous meetings. Like Sean said, it's a win. Uh, I would urge you not to move to fund transportation because what was very speci uh, specific in Mr. Sullivan and Ms. Lynch's uh, meetings is if you do that, you have to follow the regional agreement. And the regional agreement will then split this operating cost 60-40. It's unequitable. I think we have a way right now, whether it be by article or the standard way, like Mr. Waugh says, the towns can move forward how they, it's their decision at that point. We have an opinion, we have a solution. We are gonna stand up and speak on the 487 line and say later you will see a article that Mr. Heineman has drafted for the 216. It's the cleanest way to do it, it is the most equitable way to do it. Whether or not you open it back up that, that's your decision, but as far as busing goes, I think you had, I, and I agree with Mr. Fourth, this does need to get ironed out. I think there is a way it can get out, ironed out in a new regional agreement where mileage can be factored in, and this equity can be carried forward in a cleaner manner. To wrap this all in, it was very clear by Ms. Lynch and Jay Sullivan, you must follow the regional agreement, and that really does stick it to the town of Hanson. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, <clears throat> Jim. Good evening, Jim Hickey, Perry Ave, Hanson. Um, I'll cut right to the chest. Uh, Chase, I know there is an elephant in the room um, that people may or may not want to talk about it in public. Um, I agree with Randy. Um, there's been some problems in the regional agreement for a while. Um, and quite honestly, this has turned out to be a bad marriage for Hanson right now. Um, and I can tell you that people in Hanson think that the school committee um, has somehow lost their way uh, and forgot why they were voted into the seats that you all hold now. Um, I think, in, I think it can be fixed. I think we need to sit down at the table and st start from the beginning. Um, you know that we went through the deregionalization feasibility committee and now TMS is actually working on the financials 
um, of what it would cost for Hanson to leave the district. Um, you also know that I've spoke with um, Paula Hatch, um, chairwoman of Silver Lake Regional High School. Um, I've done this on my own. Last night, if you watched the Board of Selectmen's meeting, um, I got the blessing from the board to continue talks. That's all they are. Um, but as far as Hanson goes, we need to find or fix the system we have now. So, you know, I know we're kind of getting off on what this original discussion was, was meant to talk about, but David had brought it up a couple of times, and so did Mr. Simonak, with the regional agreement. We need to fix it, and we need to fix it now. Um, I mean, that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Hold on. I want to do, so what I'm going to, Beth, what I'd like to do is hear from the public, and then we're going to bring it back to the community. Oh, okay. That's all right. If I remember what I was going to say. <laughs> Jot it down real quick. I know it's been a bit. Yes, Ms. Kemet. Um, yeah. Uh, so I just want, uh, Laura Kemet, uh, 83 Bay State Circle, Hanson. Um, just wanted to mention I'm a bit gobsmacked that I'm, see, I'm hearing for the first time about legal opinions that have been received about a busing issue that our town has not seen. We have not been asked for an opinion. I, I have not seen the Whitman opinion. I have not seen the school committee's uh, council opinion. Um, that feels extremely wrong to me, um, particularly, uh, and now there's a discussion about breaking this out as a separate warrant article. Um, we've closed our warrant. We voted last night to place articles, and um, we have a deadline of Friday. Um, so unless we have some kind of an emergency meeting, um, which we can certainly do, but unless we have some kind of a last minute emergency meeting, we've got no way of, do, of effectuating this. So it feels very much as though the line of communication is broken. Um, and it's not just broken. Um, you know, I, I echo some of what um, Mr. Hickey, who j just spoke before me, said, um, which is, you know, I appreciate that there are things that one can do, but timing is everything. Um, and we are still um, spinning from the results of the change in the assessment method. We will get over it one way or another, um, and we're moving in that direction. Um, but to continue to have what feels like a very unilateral uh, conversation about the budget is not going to help heal the wounds that we've still got um, from the change in the methodology. Um, so I'm really hoping that you guys take this into consideration moving forward. I do very strongly agree with everybody that spoke about the need to sit down and look at the regional agreement. When you've got a regional agreement that um, any four or five attorneys could look at and not in any way, shape, or form agree with what the objective of the agreement is, we've got a problem. Um, and we've got a problem because we know that it doesn't accurately reflect um, the way things are being run or should be run. Um, and we can do better. And we really, honestly, if we're going to have a relationship going forward, um, you know, and I'm hopeful that we will, I, I, I really, in my, like, to the core of my being, I'm hopeful that, that this relationship will continue then I, I think we need to ha sit down and really have the tough conversations and come up with an agreement that we all feel accurately represents what each town should be bringing to the table. Um, and then we just move forward. So thanks okay. for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the one point I will just, for the record, I think it's important to understand in terms of conversations and legal opinions. Um, folks from Whitman have uh, attended I think four, Every meeting. four or so uh, budget subcommittee meetings where busing has been discussed. So those are the conversations that have occurred. Those are all public meetings. Anyone is welcome to attend. That's where the communication has occurred. We, after the last school committee meeting, received a communication from uh, Whitman's uh, attorney, mm -hmm. uh, which we then decided to engage our attorney, and that letter is in the packets tonight. So that all happened within the last week. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's kind of what we've done and why we've done it and how we've done it. So I think the only other thing that's important to understand is um, in that letter from uh, Attorney Wa, he's very clear that, you know, the towns have the ability to do with what they want to. So if Whitman is so inclined through their selectmen to set up their warrant in town meeting in a certain way, uh, it doesn't mean Hanson has to do it. 
right? So I think there's, there's clear legal mm -hmm. clarity that the boards of selectmen have that authority in terms of how they place and what they do. Just because one town does it one way doesn't mean the other town has to. Um, and I think we're all in agreement that we need to get back to the regional agreement and get something that's clear because frankly, I'm tired of spending a lot of time over the last several years trying to figure out what the bloody thing says. Um, and I think we're all tired of doing that and it's very difficult when it's not clear and we have to guess at, well, it says this and it meant this. The section that Ms. Otina referenced is you know, one of my new favorite sections. <laughs> in on one sentence, it talks about the school transportation shall be provided, but then in the next section, it talks about paid. It completely, the one is not, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't possess the, the strongest uh, understanding of the English language, but I do know when something is, one sentence says one thing and the other sentence is, and these are the problems that we're now trying to guess. Well, what did they mean in 1992 when they signed this? And we're trying to cobble this together. So I think everyone's trying to do the best job they can, but I think we all agree that words are important and the cleaner we can make this, the better off we'll be. So hopefully that's where we can move to. Sorry, Beth, you've been waiting so patiently. Or impatiently, no. Um, so in the past, you know, when when I've been at the town meetings and we vote, there, there's the school operating budget, and then there's the non-mandating budget, mm -hmm. and then capital, under. and then capital. I think there's usually yeah, three. and it's, yeah. it's different numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. it's and you vote each one. I have yet to see non-mandated not voted for, never, not even questioned. It's not even been questioned at all the town meetings that I've been, and I've been going for years. I've been a resident of. Whitman for 47 years so um, I don't have any I, I really don't worry about it not passing I really don't and I don't think Hanson would have a problem either because they don't have great sidewalks and they kids so, aren't walking down yeah the I mean you know kids live in Montplancet and stuff you're not right. going to vote you know so I really don't see that so you know are we looking to I guess what I'm looking for clarification is are we looking to leave it as that this year? So we have to decide, right? Okay. So what we so, have what we have voted okay. as a school committee, what we have is binding communication to the town. Yeah. Is a communication that basically says to both towns, we voted three things. There was a letter, certified, mm -hmm. it was sent, and it, I'm paraphrasing, but here is the operating yep. assessment, here is the non-mandated busing line, and here is the okay, capital. Now we're going to change it. So it's the top of this paper. It's, it's yeah, the right. Top. It's yeah. right. It's the right. top of that paper. Yes. So we now have an opportunity to do whatever the will of the committee is. Mm -hmm. We can simply, we can revote all three of those lines. We can revote the non-mandated lines. We can, we can, we can do what we want to do as a committee, or we can completely rescind everything and completely start over. Which, um, if that's the will of the committee, so be it. Um, oh. But that's that's where we're at. So okay. the, so there is, that's what we've set. That's where we're at, and now it's a question of what do we want to change? We, de we do need to make some changes. I mean, for the record, right, uh, to your point, the non-mandated busing line that John gave for Whitman, the one that we sent was 487, 839. Now we change. The new one would be 216, 059, and 44 cents. Right. The Hanson non-mandated line was 121, 475. The new line would be 55, 234. Right. So taking that into context, again, I, I can't prognosticate the future, but I don't, I agree, as an, as just as an independent opinion, you can all just take it as one of yours. I find it hard to believe that this is the year that we're not gonna pass non-mandated busing when we just cut the cost in half. So, but, all right, going with that, and we're talking about that, can I make a motion then, can, at this point in time, and then you can have discussion afterwards, but can I make a motion that we go with the new numbers and submit the new assessments to both towns? So for, are you for operating assessment or non-mandated busing? for the, the way that it is set up here, for the operating, then the new non-mandated, and the capital assessments doesn't okay. change. So. Second. <laughs> I, we can't do both, we have to, why do we have to each line? So um, here's, here was, here's what I'd ask, because there's very specific language that was attached to each of these assessments per yeah. MGL. Okay. So I have the language. Um, Oh. If you'd like. Oh, okay. I see what you're Perhaps mean. we can, I would just suggest maybe we start with the non-mandated busing okay. um, lines and you can do them one at a time and then you can move to the operating. But here's the language that I was given that we need to read. Okay. The bottom this two This is are, what we did the last time. Yes. It's, but the only difference is now it's an amend and this does require a two-thirds vote because everything else was two-thirds up to this point. Oh, okay. So, so do you want me to do the non-mandated first? So go ahead. 
Do you want me to do the non-mandated? I think it would be cleaner. You can do whatever you want. I just think it would be cleaner okay. to take the non-mandated first. Okay. So I make a motion to amend the FY23 cost for non-mandated bus, non busing for the town of Hanson at $55,234.19. Point of order, Chair. Yeah? Just want to be clear. We don't step in anything. The motion was made and seconded. We're now we're doing something oh, yeah. different. Well, the, well so, so I, I, I'm going to say I'm going to say the motion was not valid because it didn't follow the Thank language. You. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, unless anyone wants to feel otherwise, but I, I yeah, I mean I think to motion just okay. this is one of those where we can't just be like what he said or she said. But we have to read very specific. Okay. okay. So now we have a motion for the Hanson. For Hanson, do we have a second? Second. Okay. Do we have discussion? Yes, Chris. Um, I think my comments will capture both things. Uh, you know, I've spoken at length and, and very adamantly about partnerships. This is being a good partner. This is what being a good partner is. Working together with members of the community, finding savings, passing them along. That, I, I don't see the benefit to anyone to do anything else at this point. So, any other comments Steve I don't mind you know I had a big long speech I wanted to do and it would have probably put us all to sleep <laughs> but um, it's it's just been nerve-wracking of everything that goes on and it keeps you from participating in being what people are expecting out of you and I say that because we're looking at these two numbers, but we are hearing from people who are our, res our friends, our relatives, our fellow citizens, that they're saying we're not going with the law. We want to go with a 30-year kind of following that we've done. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to vote these because there's savings everywhere. But just like when we did the 50-50 split with the assessment, I think we, we need to use this kind of as a grace year. But I don't want to get to the end of the driveway and find the whipping police with a tow truck ready to take the blue Jeep and me to somewhere else. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that's how, that's how it can be. And, and when you in, in also include legal opinions, we're just not, we're not being neighbors anymore. We, we've got a, we've got, I know both towns have new town administrators. One of them I told, you're part of the fabric of women. You're now one of the residents. You might not live here, but you're, you're one of us. And that's what we need to keep collectively thinking. I don't want to break the law, and I want to be fair, and I want to be ec equitable. I want to pay what my responsibility is as a homeowner and a property owner. I mean, Mr. Scriven can say, Steve, I'm going to have you pay for part of mine. Would you? But, <laughs> but what, what it gets down to is like, and I know, this is a blue state. I'm not making this political. You all know where I sit. I tell you every single time. It's the way up in the balcony at the Bruins games. But anyways, <laughs> it, it, it is that the more of a push that we have others paying for us when that 60-40 thing just worked. I'm sorry, it just worked. And I, I'm not saying, you know, now we gotta ship back to that, but just think of the times. No, hang on, Fred. The, the pandemic probably has scared us all quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. But I didn't participate in uh, Whitman's strategic plan i didn't talk to any of the folks you know why because I, I just there were too many things that we had to think about we're not even talking education tonight yeah bring it back to this steve yeah, yeah. i need you i got gotcha, you i got gotcha, you i am i'm right there right. you know we haven't talked about education tonight right is that part of is that true I know you're not going to answer me. Of course, I, this is this is my frustration where we spend so much time talking about agreements and these things, yeah. but right. that's I'll that's leave, the matter I'll, in front of us. I want to move that. this. Um, I, we do have. School. Yeah, so I think the only thing I guess I, I just want to respond because I think this is really important because it's in Andy's letter explicitly. 
there is no law pertaining to non mandated transportation costs and how that's assessed. Mm -hmm. So the statutory whole thing Legal. was very clear. There is language. We literally took the statutory language and we put it in the agreement. This is not, and, and so I'm not gonna play attorney, but I, the letter that you have from counsel, he says, this, this has nothing to do with breaking the law. He is explicitly clear that there is no law pertaining to this, and it is his opinion to continue doing what we've been doing. That's what our attorney said. So I know we can all play attorney, but he is the attorney, and that's what he said. So I think that's and just got relevant. different words from Desi. Who also said they weren't okay. attorneys. Okay. <clears throat> okay. But go ahead. Done. So I, I want to clarify the vote also. It's not only for the change in the amount, as Beth read, but we're basically accepting the new mileage method, yes. if you will. Thank so you really it's a vote that. to validate yes. that the district is now, mm. going, is, is now essentially yes. using yeah. a yes. mileage Should we have voted that for I don't think we need to. No, I don't think it needs a vote, but I want to I mean, understand the reasoning yeah. behind the change in the numbers is based on yeah. yes. John so so to speak. Yeah. work yes. and so forth. Okay. All right. Anything so new? That, yeah, yes, no, thank you. Thank you for bringing that out. Absolutely. Reasoning That's, of the vote. Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else new to add? Otherwise, we're <laughs> going to move to this vote. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, Fred. Mr. Chair? Yes, Fred. Go ahead. Um, and the only thing I would add is, uh, and I don't know if we need to amend the, uh, uh, the motion. But to also reduce the assessment by the different, amount. different, no. different motion, Fred. Different, different motion, motion, different motion. Right now, we're just doing Hanson non-mandated bus in line, and if depending on how that goes, then we can move on. So, any okay? It sounds like everyone's good. Yeah. Oh, right. Can I add something? Yes. Real quick. Quickly, um, David. You know, just for context, I think. Uh, you know, when we're talking about elephants in the room and, and concerns we might have in regards to the vote relating to non-mandated busing, Ms. Otina and Ms. Byers <coughs> made a really good point about inequities. And if one town were to vote down uh, the non-mandated busing, what would that mean in the long term and what would those consequences be? So, you know, just for some context, and again, someone correct me if I'm wrong here, but if, if non-mandated busing uh, was voted down and if that in uh, return affected our budget and we'd have to come back to uh, the school committee to either reassess or revote at that point wouldn't we be able to include non-mandated busing as an operating item if it was voted down as an article yeah I mean, just food for thought but when we talk about partnership and we talk about cost savings and what we're doing for both communities and how hard we're working um, you know I, I think it should peop uh, people should be very conscientious of the article vote and if we want to work as a partnership, then we should support non-mandated busing as we have for the last uh, 30 years so then we can move forward and then work on the regional agreement and kind of iron out this process. So I just want to add that. Okay. So. Voice vote. We're going to move to the vote then. Roll call. Yes, and it's a roll call, and we'll go backwards this time because yeah. I, need I need more confusion in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be fair. Beth. Yes. Chris. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Fred. Yes. Chris Howard, yes. David. Yes. Don. Yes. Uh, Michelle. Yes. Steve. Yes. Oh, you guys made that easier on my heart. Okay. No. Unanimous. So no. nine, nine. It needed the two thirds of the vote carries. Okay. Motion to amend the FY23 cost for non-mandated busing for the town of Whitman at two hundred sixteen thousand fifty-nine dollars and forty-four cents. Second. Any discussion? Probably the same discussion we just had. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we'll go. Uh, we'll go back this way, Steve, if you don't mind. Yes. 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 Oh, sorry, 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 Steve, oh. Michelle. Sorry, I'm trying to tally. Michelle, yes. Don. Yes. yes. David, I'll vote yes. Michelle. Nope. I mean Hillary. Hillary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> got you. I, you knew I was gonna mess I it got up. You. I got you. Fred. Yes. Chris. Yes. Beth. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And in the regional agreement, we're going to put, we're never doing roll call votes. <laughs> <laughs> that name's here. Uh, okay, so next. Challenge. Uh, Ready? Yeah. The assessment, what part now? Uh, yes, so okay. it sounds like if you want to, yes, go ahead. Okay. You have whatever language you want to use there. I'll, I'll use what's here, I guess. Motion to amend the operating assessment to the town of Hanson for the FY 2023 budget in accordance with the PK-212 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement, Section uh, 4E2 and MGL uh, Chapter 71, verse 16B, at, so Hanson, 
thirteen million two hundred forty five thousand fifty two dollars and four cents. Second. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. I didn't scroll down. Discussion. Yes, Chris seconded. Discussion. David. Uh, the changes to the assessment would just be reflecting the mileage based assessment. Yes. Nothing else, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question. Yes, Don. So, with this recognition of savings, how else could um, this be used in the district? Can it be, you know, essentially it's, it's additional reimbursement coming in, mm -hmm. right? But is that strictly dedicated to a pass through with savings to the towns? Or does it go in the general fund where? A decision of the committee could be made based on our other needs or our other strategic plan, our related arts goal that we had. So I have, um, does it need to be used uh, to reduce assessment? I guess that's my question. <laughs> so no, I don't think it has to be used to reduce the assessment, um, but we just need to balance the budget. So something would have to be done. Okay. okay. Chris? Yeah, just through you to Ms. Byers. Um, we voted uh, a budget a couple weeks ago that we know we, we knew what we needed and we knew it was gonna present a hardship for Hanson particularly mm -hmm. and, and, and to a certain extent and Whitman as well. Um, and again, in the spirit of partnership, particularly uh, with the involvement of the community members facilitating this and in initiating this, I, I w just think it's the right thing to do at this mm -hmm. point in time to pass the savings back on to the communities um, because there will be a time maybe very soon when we're coming to them for our needs and I think we need to bear that in mind mm -hmm. That's all. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah and I guess I would just add to that too we have the five-year strategic plan in the budget right and so I think giving the savings back to the towns to Chris's point, is that partnership that, you know, have a penny for every time we say that word. Um, but I think it's important for this year. I think that with the strategic plan, uh, our, our um, goals that we have for the committee, we know the one-to-one -one Chromebooks is gonna present financial implications later. We haven't even gotten the robust related arts off the ground. Um, so if we're presenting a savings this year and if the busing reimbursement is presenting more reimbursements moving forward, this could and will be a good thing so that maybe we're not having these really difficult conversations. Is it a need or is it a want in the future? That would be my hope. If we move in this way this year to demonstrate that we are willing to work with the towns and to give them a savings and to provide opportunities to our students. Okay. Yes. I just want to add, I... Yeah, hold on, Michelle and then Fred. I just want to add that I agree with them. I think we can pass the savings on to the town 100%. That's where I land. Okay. Fred? Uh, two things. One, we will reap the benefits of this for many years to come. Mm. Uh, number two, we're in this position because of the diligent efforts of a couple of citizens. Uh, I think that we sort of owe it to the towns, you know, to give them that breather, you know, that they're so, so thoroughly asking for right now in being good partners uh, with this. Okay, thank you, Fred. David? Um, you know, year in and year out, uh, ever since I was in high school, one common word, a buzzword I hear, every budget season is partnership and I just you know I don't disagree with anything that anyone has said um, but I want to remind uh, my colleagues sitting at this table that when we're talking about partnerships who is our constituents who are the people we are representing those are the students you know uh, Steve Boys made a remark a couple minutes ago about how we don't talk about education too much and I do agree with him there um, but I just want to, to keep in mind that with the decisions we make going forward uh, whether it's this year or next fiscal year or onward um, Yes, partnership is important, but make sure it doesn't come at the expense of our students who we need to represent and who have been dealing with um, a, a really tough decade, I'd say. Uh, not just the pandemic, 
opioid epidemic, Great Recession, who knows, we might be on the verge of another recession. Um, you know, our constituents have suffered immensely and they haven't had the services they need and that they deserved. And if we're going to provide them with the tools to succeed, we need to make sure that we are doing that. And if there is another avenue that we can explore to make sure we are achieving our goals to help our constituents, then we need to do that. And I'm not saying I, I disagree with uh, returning the savings back to the, the town of Whitman or Hanson, but I just want to make sure when we're using the word partnership, make sure it's not coming at the expense of our constituents, which are our students who are not able to vote and aren't necessarily here every meeting. Um, you know, so I just want people to be really aware of that, of who we represent and who we're there for is the students in this district. So don't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Don. The reduction in the assessment numbers that Beth has read is a total of $250,000. Um, I heard somebody say that we set this budget and we knew it was going to be a hardship to Hanson. I don't recall hearing that. I know in the past um, towns have said they're unable to afford the assessments and at the end of the year when I see the Department of Revenue certify money they end up with upwards of 1.5, 1.9 million in free cash. Um, certainly that can be for various reasons, maybe not directly associated with how they're funding education from the town budget. Um, I'm looking at this report we saw tonight, OPEB contributions from our operating budget. Nothing in 2020, nothing in 2021, 2022, $250,000. We could put it right in a line item. We could fund an OPEB assessment that both of the towns fund from their municipal budgets every year. They fund OPEB and we do not as a district. Yeah. Wait, good, Chris? Yeah. Um, so, David, Dawn, I, I sh share your concerns and I share your sentiments. Um, my qualifying remark was at this time, right? right. And, and again, it's about understanding the dynamics and the complexities of our partnership with keeping in mind that we're here to ultimately and eventually get to where we want to be to provide for our students with the services that we want to bring back in. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of this is about timing and, and I think it's important that we recognize that and, and again you know be, being a good partner is, is doing that. But now is the time right? Now is the time for okay, these kids they don't get it. You know, I know, I'm not now is the time. I yeah. vote to move the question. Uh, Randy, you got something quick? Mm -hmm. Super quick. Um, Randy Lamartine again, Selectman. Uh, this is not found money in the budget. No. Uh, so the way you're actually coming up with the $250,000 is you're getting a reimbursement and still charging the town. And that's how you're making out. So it's not found money in the budget. You're overcharging us essentially because mm -hmm. you're getting a reimbursement but saying, no, we still need that money to pay that bill. That's the problem. And I don't think that's going to fly tremendously well at town meeting. So, I mean, it really is a productive meeting where we've all found something that benefits everyone. And I would just say, I, I hope the, fin the meeting finishes that way. Fair enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? I think the one point I guess I'll just make when I think of the overall budget and the initial request and where we're at, mm -hmm. Um, and I have listened to um, the selectmen's meetings in both towns pertaining to the budget. So I know they are both working towards trying to get to where um, they can support things. Um, I do think, to Randy's last point, taking some of these uh, additional reimbursable funds and reducing the operating assessment does to help the towns. I also think it's important to recognize that while we maybe don't have everything we want in our budget this year, we do have a number of things that are helping us move forward and you know no small matter is uh the no cost full day k that's something that's been talked about for many 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 years and that is here so i do you know again i'm, I'm one of ten one of nine tonight but i think for me i do feel like this is a good step forward in terms of of where we're trying to go um and then we do have a lot of work to do in the future in terms of planning to make sure that we do pull in a lot of the things that we need and there's that understanding from the town standpoint from a fiscal standpoint so um, you know I am I am certainly in favor of of, of moving forward with um, the motion so mm -hmm. any other comments all right we'll move to the vote which way did I go last time I should just keep it the same 
I went that way, so I start with you this time. Okay. All right. Here. No, I'm asking. Like, if I'm looking for you, Beth. You oh, I'm with here. her. It's, it's getting late. <laughs> you so. want me? Okay. Uh, go ahead. Beth says yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, Chris. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Hillary. Sorry, I'm just letting you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever you want. Chris Howard. Yes. David. Uh, Fred. Yeah. David. <laughs> yes. Don. No. Michelle. Yes. Steve. Yes. Great. Okay. So that's eight. Okay. That is. Yes, out of possible ten. That was yes, Hanson. So now you have one more, right? Right. Okay. So my motion is to amend the operating assessment to the town of Whitman for the FY 2023 budget in accordance with the PK to 12 Whitman Hanson Regional School District Agreement, Section 4, E2, and Mass General Laws, uh, Chapter 71, Verse 16B. At and so Whitman operating will be sixteen million seven hundred forty-one thousand one hundred nineteen dollars and thirty cents. Second. Great. Thank you, Beth. Any discussion, or have we basically had it? Had it. Had the discussion with the last one, right? Yes. Okay. No one knew. We're good. Steve, do you mind? Steve. Yes. Michelle. Yes. Don. No. David. Yes. I vote yes. Fred. Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Beth? Yes. Okay. So that carries 8-1. All right. I think that yeah. closes that one out. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. The chair? Oh. That's Fred's piece. Yeah, go ahead, Fred. Two different uh, I'd like to make a motion to reduce the capital assessment. Uh, to reduce the assessment, uh, capital assessment to the town of Canton. The amount of fifty-one thousand two hundred twenty dollars from the current amount of four hundred eighty-one thousand nine hundred thirteen dollars and twelve cents. And my theory behind this is the purchase of the two trucks. That's not, uh, I would subsequently be making a motion immediately thereafter that we would take uh, the money for two trucks from E and D, and therefore we can try and purchase them immediately and perhaps get out of the back jam uh, that's taking some towns and districts a year uh, to buy equipment or to get take delivery of equipment once approved. And I believe our uh, e and D balance is with that. So yeah, hang on. So I'm not sure those are in the budget we're voting on presently, correct? Do we have capital items on here? Um, these are the amounts that are required for yep. uh, debt service. So do we want to put, when is our next meeting? May 13th. Oh, so it'll be after. But yeah. can I just ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Didn't we already vote on that mm -hmm. and not, and say no? No, we said it wasn't part of the operating budget. Essentially what we were saying. Okay, okay. This time, okay. Um, so, I think. So Fred, what John is saying, those capital assessments are debt, correct? If, if I'm thinking what you're thinking, you're looking at the school committee to correct, correct. Vote, vote to take certain warrant articles off and use use E and D to support warrant articles, not these assessments. These assessments are debt. Okay, so those aren't for the capital items whatsoever? No, not at all. Oh yeah, the capital line that we voted is the existing capital. Right, that's not, that doesn't presume the additional those, new those, items. That those those warrants to went to town. Right, it's something different than this. These are actual debt. This is high school debt. This is HVAC debt. This is different debt. We sent separate warrant articles from the committee that both Lincoln and Lisa have put on for warrants. So if you wanted to take those trucks off, that's a different. That's using E and D to take off warrant articles, not not these line items. Okay, so. I'll so, Chair, do I have the uh, latitude where we're talking about budget? So let's get this uh, done first. The motion uh, for those warrant articles. Two separate things. Right now, let's get this done first, and then if you want to talk about that, because we're still in budget discussion. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to think through it. I think technically, I don't know. I feel like capital is not in budget. I think the workaround would be if the committee is so inclined, we can have a meeting and sure. put yeah. it on the agenda. Do I, don't, I don't feel prepared to get into this at this point. Um, I mean, I think if we. Right. Well, there's no motion either, or no second. So right now, there's no second, Fred. Um, okay. 
but i would say that if the committee is so inclined we can certainly so it's done clearly and people are prepared we could and i'm gonna i'll save this for the very end of our conversation tonight we could have another meeting before town meeting put capital items on the agenda and talk through what you want to talk through now is that if, if we if that's so we can leave it to the will of the committee we can and that would be the will of the committee yeah and, and, and mr stanbrook john do we have to vote a new i mean we re-voted some assessment numbers the overall town of whitman assessment has changed that has to be voted correct uh we did not vote that last time if i remember no we right. just voted these yeah yes. i think well, we just we'll tally them in the letter right okay. i don't think we need to vote it okay Are we just got to do the math right sure yes, you know okay. what was previously voted yes. for capital plus the new for non-mandated plus yep. on the march 16th meeting you you voted three separate right amounts okay yeah so michelle we'll just need to send out an amended letter and still change yep. the total Perfect. so okay awesome. thank you um we are i think we're done with that one we're done with budget that one we're never done with budget <laughs> <laughs> but All we right. can go to john's financial reports yep. john why don't you jump up there and give us an update of where we're at please um our food service director nadine doucette has been um waiting for a while i was wondering if we could yes have her sure. come up uh, uh, come up first or yeah. if we could just skip to that and she can help go ahead if I, if I need it um this is the the food service uh, price pricing information um, as of yesterday the, this document right here um, and go for it. no Okay, so for compliance with the National School Lunch Program, yes, sorry, yes, um, our minimum base prices of lunches have to meet their requirements. Over the pandemic, when we shut down, we were actually going to have to um, raise prices, but then all meals were free. So that hasn't really been an issue, but unfortunately, the meals are not gonna be funded next year. Um, for all free federally. Mm -hmm. The only thing that may happen, and it's not looking very good, is that if Massachusetts take, decides to pick up the difference. Yeah. And I don't have any answer to that yet. But um, in order to be compliant, we'd have to raise this year's lunch prices to 318 and the breakfast meal to 159. Um, next year, We'd have to be at 331 and breakfast at 166. 2024, we'd have to be 347, 174. So my proposal is to raise the prices to 350 for lunch and 175 for breakfast. And in doing so, we will not have to make another we won't have to raise it again for a little while and it will make sure that we are following the regulations so do you okay. have any questions and so just to clarify this we have to do this to be compliant yes for all of those years or just for fy22 so for to be compliant we'd have to raise it to 318 for <laughs> fy22 which we're almost done with yep if it's to, to be compliant next year, it would be 330. Okay, so those are all, all these rates are bringing us into compliance. compliance. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank if you. We go, if we just make the jump to the 350 and the 175, it will cover it for the next couple of years. So. Got it. Mm -hmm. So any questions or motion? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Don. And you mentioned the, the free lunches that are provided now through the federal government and I, that's set to expire the end of June, I think. June 30th, yeah. yes. Yeah, so yeah. unless the federal government votes it again, all schools in all towns will begin charging. Right. And now states are looking at whether or not they can afford to cover the costs okay. for all of those that right. don't qualify. Yes. Yeah, but we want to be prepared with these rates if we need yeah, to be. Right. And I don't be able to get those reimbursables mm. right now. So. Good. Thank you. Chris? Does this require a vote? Yes. 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 Um, yeah, very nominal price increase. I, yep. You want to make that motion? I will make that motion. <laughs> this. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, Chris, is, you're making a motion to accept as presented? Yes. The Great. The okay. new price, the 350 Correct. The price is the all the way through. So it would be FY 22, 23, 24. Well, it's Tuesday. She wants to go to two, 
three fifty now. Right. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me, um, Michelle brought up a good point. Like, when would this go into effect? This would go into effect at um, July one. July one. So we're voting to go to 350 for lunch and 175 for breakfast. Yeah. So okay. she doesn't Effective. have to come to us every year. 63024. Yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yep. Okay. Voice. Voice seconded. Yep. Steve seconded. Any other discussion? Voice. Yep. Chris motion. Steve seconded. Thank you. Everyone's good. <laughs> Steve, you mind? Steve. Yes. Shaw. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Chris. Yes. Fred. Yes. Hillary? Yes. Chris? Yes. Best? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is the monthly report. Uh, this is on the quarters. Um, we'll do a little bit more in depth, but I know we're a little bit later so I'll, I'll yeah you can probably quickly, keep it brief jump, anything we need to know because then you have that other proposal too right yes yeah um so the uh the first document is the balance sheet comparison well first of all let me go back you you should have gotten the report through march um of for fiscal year 22 it was a 19 page document <laughs> it looks like yeah looks like this it's it just gives a, an out, outline of um, where we are uh, through March right now we on a, a budget of fifty six million seven hundred ninety seven thousand where we received forty two million um, we still have fourteen million four forty nine to go on the revenue um, again on the expenses the we have spent thirty nine million seven hundred seventy thousand uh, dollars um, through March um, and I can go through more of it as when I go to these other documents, which are the comparison documents between last year and this year. Um, the next document is the balance sheet comparison. Um, it has the fiscal year 21 column through March and then the fiscal year 22 column through March for balance sheet items. Uh, you see cash is up 199,000 or 3.82%. Accrued payrolls and withholdings are down. Um, and then res under the reserves, uh, uh, total fund equities, um, I did a something for March is um, I put in the end of the year FY21 numbers. Um, and so then we could just uh, extrapolate that out as we go forward through the last three months of the year. Last year's reserve for encumbrances were 553,000. Again, I'm rounding numbers off. So I assumed that for this year, just that we aren't at the end of the year. We don't have any encumbrances yet, but I'm just assuming that we would have the same amount as last year. Um, the reserve for expenditures is 526,000. That's the amount of, free, uh, of, of excess and deficiency or E&D that you're gonna be using, plus a small amount of the next reserve of band and bond premiums that mm -hmm. has to be, be used every year. Um, so the total of the fund equities are 4.998 versus 4.627 from last year or up $371,000. So again, the way to look at this is if the fiscal year ended on March 31st, this is where we would be. Of course, it doesn't end there, but we're just trying to, I'm trying to come up with something to have some sort of comparison of where we are from year to year. Um, the second part of that document is the revenue expenditure comparisons. Again, uh, uh, broken down by types of revenue year to year. Uh, we're up uh, 1.995 as a total revenue or 4.95% in the general fund. And then the expenditures are broken down by functions, DESE functions. And you can see the, the differences there and through March, we're at 39.770, or we've, we've spent 2.45 more than last year, or a 6.59% increase. Um, and then down below there is just the fund balance activities of where what's going on um, from one year to the next. So, um, I mean, again, I went through this stuff very quickly, and I can talk more if you'd like, but um, the that, that's what's going on with that sheet. The next sheet is the one that's... Um, actual comparisons these are just the expenditures um, from year to year from uh, through March um, in the past in the quarters I've highlighted items that would stand out um, in each function and they are this the same function uh, functions as have been the last uh, few quarters um, again the total down the bottom is 2.459 or a 6.59 percent increase um, I can 
go through if you'd like for more, but um, that's where we are there. And then the final do document there is, um, in this is the, the um, revenue and expenditure schedule. And this is for every other fund other than the general fund through March. Um, and it's broken out by grants, by revolving fund, by gifts, um, by capital projects, trust funds and agencies. And these are the, uh, the balances, uh, the beginning balance, the revenues up to March, transfers in and out, and then expenditures to give you the ending balance as of right now. The ones that are shaded on this document are, uh, are negative, um, but those, those amounts uh, that are shaded are negative only because of timing issues. Um, we've applied for grants and haven't got the money yet, and we didn't get, didn't get the money in time. There are no deficits as of right now. Um, other than, um, because it, especially on page two of that document with, um, with Whitman Capital Repairs and, um, and uh, high school capital repairs, uh, the, just the timing of build the towns and they just haven't, ha um, we haven't received the, the payment yet. It's not, it should not be a problem at all. Again, there's a large one on page three. Um, that's what the auditors were talking about earlier. That's a, a Hanson HVAC at the middle school um, and it, that looks bad as a million sixty-one for a deficit, but we have a bond anticipation note of one million sixty-five thousand, something like that, um, that w that covers that amount. So it's a technical deficit, but it isn't a real deficit. Uh, we we have the money, and we're going to roll that note in June um, in order to that we won't have a deficit in any of those funds. Um, so that's the speed reading version of the quarterly report. Uh, if you like to have more uh, one other quick thing too I, I included in your packet was uh, every month I've been giving um, um, a deficit updates um, so what I what I did was um, I, I'm going to split the I mean I don't know if this will work or not I, had, I didn't get a chance to talk to the budget subcommittee about it but it was on the agenda for the last meeting it was to break up the general fund costs um, by you know, regular day costs and special education costs to find out which deficits are, are, are um, uh, you know, need to be funded, I guess, at the, by the end of the year. Um, and with the thinking that special education costs should be funding other special education costs with transfers, regular day costs should fund regular day costs if possible. Um, so these two sheets were the special education portion of where this, this very small print that I got to have my glasses on so I can read it. Um, these are the this is the um, extrapolation out until the end of the year of every single general fund special education cost. Um, the way to read this is to look down the bottom and where it says uh, variance of one hundred and seventeen thousand one eighty five eleven. That's the amount uh, as of right now. Uh, uh, what I would think we would turn back from the special education costs that were approved in the FY22 budget. So the appropriated bu budget that was special re uh, special education related was 11.7 million down the bottom there. The, the forecasted sped turn back as of right now. Again, things can change. Are 117,185.11. So right now the percentage to, that of sped costs that are forecasted to be turned back a one percent. That's how to look at that. The second page is if we were to do transfers tonight, and, I, and it's not on the agenda, but these would be the transfers in the special education of where the money's coming from and where the money's going to. Um, if this works, I'll do it for the, I'm almost done with the other regular day portion of the budget. It'll be a little bit more lengthy than this, um, but this will be a breakdown of where those transfers will come from. So hopefully by the next meeting, we'll have a transfer of, a, a realistic transfer number, and you can the, the school committee can decide what they would like to do with it. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it's a, a little bit different than the monthly thing that I've been sending in the past. Um, any questions or comments? Nope. Or? John, you want to go to the next piece about on, the uh, on the capital project disposition of funds, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, so the next one is the capital projects disposition. Uh, this was talked about at the last budget subcommittee meeting. There are these are funds that have been on the district's books uh, for quite quite a while. The cover sheet shows the um, what the funds are. They start with six thousand one high school band premiums. It goes to six thousand nine high school debt refunding. Those two we've already talked about at a previous meeting. Those those were old band and bond premiums that have to be 
reserved in the general fund, so we've taken care of them. That's why they're shaded out. It's the other ones from 6002 to 6008. Um, those are amounts that, that have been on the books, uh, some of them the, with the ADA compliance project and the football study, sometime earlier than fiscal year 2000, at least 20 years. Um, and I, I was bringing it forward to the committee for uh, what I'd like to try to clean these uh, uh, items up, uh, these funds up one way or another, get them off the books if possible. If not, that's fine. Um, so the, the sheet that I came up with was the amount um, and then the things I thought of of what you could do with them. Uh, the first one, of course, is do nothing. You can always do nothing, and we've been doing that. The number two is to be clo to close them and just transfer that whatever money is there to the general fund at the end of the year. Um, we could return the t uh, the amounts to the towns um, before June 30th, 22. It would be somewhat difficult to do 6,002 and 6,003 because we don't know who they came from, from, from what towns they came. So it, I don't know how we could do that, but that is a, a choice you could have. Um, or we could keep the funds, spend on similar projects. That's number four. And then I put number five in, just in case you can come up with something else that I can't think of. Um, so this is kind of a, more of a discussion and to see what the committee would like to do with it. Yeah, so this came up with the budget subcommittee and we did talk about, um, I think we talked about using it for other projects. We, talked about returning to the towns, uh, maybe even going to articles, but I think we quickly realized that it was really out of the scope of the budget subcommittee because we were gonna need to make a decision. So uh, we can certainly rehash some of that that was shared in the pros and cons, but that's, that's why we really wanted to bring it here because we just felt it was gonna be futile to just try and make a recommendation when ultimately the committee was gonna have to decide. So uh, yes, Beth. So what I'd like to see done is the ones that are specific to each town, uh, like Hanson, like 6,004, 6,005, go specifically to Hanson, 6 um, and 8, go to Whitman. And those other two that we do not know, add them together and split them between the two towns. That's what I like. Because since we don't know which one to give them to, I say add the 12,736.20 and the 165.16 together, divide them and give them back. I say... Uh, give them back to the town at this point everybody was talking about doing things and helping out the towns granted it's not a lot of money but it was their projects and so that's that's just my opinion yep thank you other comments david um i mean i pretty much agree with uh beth on this anything that says uh specifically towards hansen specifically towards whitman i think should be returned at this point um, as for the ADA compliance project and the football study, uh, we talked about it briefly during budget subcommittee. Uh, I know Stan Brook, you were saying you were unable to find the origins. If we're able to do that, I think that would be ideal just because I think uh, the idea of taking and splitting it 50-50 might be may, may possibly more complicated than it needs to be, you know, and that's only my concern there. Um, but if we're able to find the origins and figure out which towns that could go to, um, I think it would make sense to return it. Um, to them, but as for uh, 6,004 and 5 uh, to Hanson and 6,006 and 8, I mean, I think that would make sense to go back to Whitman. Uh, my only concern that I see here, and we talked about it briefly during the subcommittee, is, is just the vault roof and just making sure we're not, uh, you know, taking away anything that may be need for that if it is. But uh, to my understanding, we kind of address that and that um, doesn't seem to be a concern unless anyone has anything to say right now. But yeah, so I, I agree. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at. So the only thing um, I think I threw out, <clears throat> um, just to make sure we all have the same data points. So I agree with Beth and David, 6,004 through eight, I fully believe should be returned. It was you know, voted at town meeting for specific projects. The only thing I suggested for 2002 and three was to hang on to them until we're done, because John's not done. Mm -hmm. So rather than do like a piecemeal of, hey, we're not sure, Let's get, let's, so, um, you know, we could certainly authorize John as he comes with other ones that are identified to either town to return them, but then when he's done, maybe look at the full list and then okay. just either have a communication or meeting good. and see if we can get consensus maybe with the two town administrators to say, this is what we found, this is what we'd like to do, are you both good with it? I would hate to be in a situation where we do something and then, well, technically it's not a 60-40 split, or, uh, so. Mm. No good deed sometimes goes unpunished. Yeah, um, yeah. But to me, the th four through six thousand four through six thousand eight, yeah. completely clear. So, 
Um, I don't know if we that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Do we need a motion? Yeah, if we could. So I would, um, maybe we could, so John, tell me before we make the motion, if we made a motion to say that as you identify um, these type of capital funds and they belong to a town that you just disperse them as reasonably fit um, with the understanding that the other ones we're just gonna compile until we get the full list. Okay. Um, we're not gonna go anywhere, they're not gonna be spent, we're just putting them off to the side. Something, okay. something like that, does that work? Yes. I don't know if you feel comfortable turning okay. that into a motion. <laughs> yeah. So this list is not inclusive of all accounts that have He's balances? still working through accounts. He's still cleaning up. Okay. So this is a partial work in So process. it's only a preview. It's yes. <laughs> yes. And John being John said, I'm kind of uncomfortable with what I found just sitting on it. And we said, of course, bring it. So look at this and guess what? There's more. Yeah. There's probably more. Okay. Um, okay. So, I mean, we could make it simple and just say, you just bring it to the committee and we'll just deal with it. Maybe then yeah, there's transparency so yeah. we know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we can certainly, but I think we should, can we get a motion to say for 6004 through 6008, those will be returned to the respective towns? So moved. Second. Any other discussion on that? Everyone's reasonably okay? We'll, yes. we'll call vote. Steve. Michelle. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. I'll vote yes. Fred. Yes. Uh, Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. Beth. Yes. Great. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, John. All right. Where are we going next? So, so we had a an, uh, an equity audit review. And let me just tell you how, it, how that came about. When I became superintendent, and, and at the first couple meetings I met, Sorry. I remember that, that group NISIP with the superintendent and orientation group uh, training that I had, or it was an orientation. The focus of, of our induction was really looking at equitable services for all students in your district. And certain districts were way ahead of the game. Our district, we haven't really done a review to see if we are servicing all of our students or providing an equitable education for every student pre-K to 22. So we talked about that this, this summer. I put George as, as point person and we had this review done. We could spend a full meeting going through this and I know you have it in your packet, you've been able to, or in the, in the drive to review it, but I wanted George to give you a couple of, of bullet points of where we're at. Um, and this is gonna be an ongoing conversation. I know Mr. Boyce talked about students. We'd like to bring this back about students a little bit at every meeting. And this is, is, this is what we're doing as a leadership team, looking at where we can, we can improve ourselves to make sure we are servicing every student in, in district. So George? Sure, um, I can be brief. I know it's 8.42. Um, basically what happened is you all have the audit in front of you. Jeff described why we did it. And I just wanted to bring you up to speed on not only the audit itself, because there are six pages of findings in it, but basically what we've done since we've received it. Um, what we use this audit for internally was to identify the areas that we need to work on. The biggest areas that we need to work on as a district are our MTSS framework and why we needed it, which is tied to the ESSER law, is our state of English learners. Um, we are now leaving a low incidence district. We are now a um, moderate incident district and all of the ramifications and issues and things that come with that. And then we also um, really want to use it for what do we consider equity to mean? Um, I think the easiest definition I can come up with, and I, I tried to make this about me, um, is that if you look at a person who's vertically challenged, right, not that <laughs> tall, what does equity mean to that person? So if you look at that person who's trying to get into the cupboard to get a box of cereal, equity means that that person, every person has the ability to be able to get what they need in order to be successful. So if you're a short person like myself, I might need a two-step in order to get to that cupboard to get the cereal. Somebody who's tall, I'll go with Scriven, I guess. He's the only guy here that's taller. Uh, I, would say, I would say doesn't need that. He can just grab it. But at the end, we can both access that box of cereal because we have the tools and the things that we need to do it. Another one you might talk about, because I'm wearing glasses now because I screwed up my contacts, is somebody who has vision, somebody who has maybe a vision impairment. Kids go to this school. People who come to this building and... If, you're hard, if you have an issue seeing, you wear glasses, you wear contacts, you do all of those things. Some of us, and that helps you get around and orient yourself around the building. Some of us don't have that ability because we've lost our ability to see whatsoever. 
So you will notice that on our signs, they're in Braille because everyone now has the ability to enter the building and orient themselves or get to where they need to go in the building because it's equitable. Not everything we do, not everything we have in this district is equitable. So what this is doing is giving us a blueprint based on law and then based on the things we need to do to establish equity in the district. It really centers around a working definition of equity. It really centers around our MTS framework of intervention. And it really centers around our EL population. It also centers around our students who are of color or have um, different orientation as far as their sexual orientation. It also, though, leads to what we're trying to do in our next budget item is the creation of an equity and MTSS director. Jeff talked about this a little bit last month or last time we had a meeting, and we are now looking at splitting some of the positions that we have. We have a, um, a student services director. We're looking to split that back into a special ed director because that's big enough in itself for the size of the district. And then we're looking to internally post for an MTSS and equity director. And that person is really galvanizing not only this document, but galvanizing what equity means in Whitman Hanson as we move forward. This document is a blueprint. It talks about policy. It talks about some of the other things. Mm -hmm. I also want to let the committee know that when it talks about our EL population, one of the biggest things it talked about was to have a separate curriculum for those students because they do need it based on their individual reading level. We were able to establish that this year, and we are able, we are, we've identified a program that we are going to buy that will be used along with the work that there is done in the regular classroom for EL students, but we have identified um, a company that we're going to go with to provide that curriculum. It is actually a low cost curriculum and it's easily absorbed within the budget that we currently have. So what this has done is pave the way for our next steps and it's a blueprint for what we need to do as we move forward. It's talked about with the superintendents, it's talked about with the mass superintendents group, it's talked about in the law of ESSA, it's talked about in educator evaluation, which is law 603.5, and it's talked about um, in EL language. And this is the next natural step that I think we need in the evolution of Whitman Hanson. I can take questions, but I'd also then like to segue, if you could, to the job description that we have in front of you. Uh, there's a job description that you have in front of you for equity and MTSS director. I'd like to call that MTS um, because that's, uh, that's a long word. That's a bunch okay. of words, if not. But if we have an MTS director, you will see specific things that that job respond that that person is responsible for. This job description was a culmination of districts that we went through, we asked about, we talked about, both in Massachusetts and nationally. And it was also based on research. And we culled and we put some things together so that we feel that in an internal posting, we can cover this and make Whitman Hanson move or step forward in the right direction so that we can do what's best for all of our students, all of our staff, and then the resulting community. Motion to accept or approve the M test. Good. Oh, uh, position. Great. And Fred has dropped off, so we are no longer doing roll call votes. Okay. So I appreciate Fred attending, but I appreciate not doing any more roll call votes. Any discussion? Yes. Okay, this is for this year? This would be for this coming school year. Coming school year. So is that money in our budget? That money it will be is in the budget because it's going to be part of the reorganization that the superintendent discussed last year. There will be no greater impact to the budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Other comments, questions? Can yeah. Can you remind us of that reorganization? So so it's, it's, <laughs> thank you. So as Lauren vacates her position, okay. she used to be the the director of student services. Yeah. That job has become over encompassing, and we have people in district in special education that we can grow their position and accommodate this position by taking some things away from the current Lauren position. Okay. okay. Like EL, like a few things okay. that became I th overwhelming for her. I think my, yeah, thank you. Because um, my question was going to be you know, next meeting, are you going to come with us with a candidate to fill Lauren's position? In my mind, no, I was thinking, close, yeah. no, right. we have that contract to approve tonight. So yeah. uh, parameters. The, yeah. Yes, we're just okay. starting that. Okay. So, so we're looking at this. How could we absorb this? And we have people 
we have positions in district we can move what they do now right. to make this whole for us and make us a better district okay right and, and so and basically you're going to be looking at the special ed and accommodations and testing aspect and then you're going to be looking at the el and student services aspect and we're separating those those pieces and with the mtss framework that we've instituted all year there have been um, a number of people who we feel can succeed and move forward with a restructuring that is not an imp that is not a greater impact to the budget, budget. <clears throat> right. okay. Okay. but it has to be posted and everything. Yep. So, yes quick question well, um, I understand that this came from the audit yeah um, well yeah, yes and no we talked about this last year yeah. as we were going to MTSS mm -hmm. and, and the interventionist coaches that started that dialogue right. and then over the summer and this year we we realized with with some of the data from the audit said hey look you could do this and then the the spurning off was when Lauren had the conversation with me saying my job is becoming over in, in, encompassing mm -hmm. and it just brought us to what can we do district-wide to make this better and service our kids in the in the in the most efficient way hitting the cores that we want to hit understood and I didn't mean to mischaracterize the yeah. evolution of this. Yeah, it just didn't come directly. From, yeah. It's a recommendation, but it was something we talked about last year. So we're using the audit um, to uh, that the audit has helped us identify areas where there's inequity. Correct. Okay. Yes. That's kind absolutely of correct. Yes. Correct. Um, so that's great. I'm, uh, so uh, my question pertains to the, the future. Like, how is how are these going to be identified, and what's that process going to look like? And I see. A little bit of continuous improvement on programs and systems and collaborating with stakeholders but if you could just maybe get into that a little deeper i'm curious to sure so so the person uh so if we take the job and then you look at the the audit globally um one of the the first major hurdle we have to do and the first major decision we have to do is what's the working definition of equity and women hands that that's going to be with stakeholders that's going to be with a working group there is also policy implications when you look at um what takes place for equity from a teaching standpoint as it's based on their ed eval and then what takes place just from a normal policy point when we talk about gender race mm -hmm. ethnicity sexual orientation all of those pieces mm -hmm. but then when we talk about the actual everyday components of it this person is going to be responsible for our whole mtss framework and then responsible for our el components other than that they're also going to be responsible for things um, like analyzing the curriculum to make sure the curriculum is one that is representative of all the groups that we, of all the groups of students that we have in school. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be not only in school, but it's going to be connected to a working group that would be comprised of like our wellness committee, that would be comprised of staff, that would be comprised of, I'm sure, school committee representation, that would be comprised of parent or teacher or student even representation based on the level. But that is what this job would entail. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Any other discussion? So, just one follow up as I'm reading through this. Um, it, it's around like page 11, but it, it refers to our district policy. Um, and maybe this is something to look ahead towards because it talks about definition of equity in our mission statement. So, yeah. something yeah, in the future to yeah. hone in on and, and maybe you know pull from this yep. another piece that we can improve on. Absolutely. And the reason for this really is that I'll put this in a nice statement is that when we talk about equity, I was at a, a deficit from knowledge. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to get an outside opinion to make sure we're doing things as best we can. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah. All right. Remember, we're raising our hands this time, mercifully. <laughs> All right, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor? Thank you. Very unanimous. Thanks. All right, we're going to jump around a little bit. Um, Thanks, George just because I want to hit a couple things just looking at some folks that are here um, waiting for certain things. So real quick, I want to jump to the school committee liaison role, which was number 15. Um, so this was an item that had come up in a previous meeting. Mike had asked about the role and then he had followed up with me and said, hey, what is, what is this liaison role? What is it? Um, so uh, I had reached out to Randy. He had sent me the selectman's handbook, shared it with all of you. It does have the definition in there. Um, and you know, my main takeaway here was that it's really about the communication between the boards. I saw that as defined in the in the role. Um, the other thing is, you know, from time to time, um, I have reached out to the respective board chairs of selectmen or um, 
just giving them a heads up, like, hey, you might want to pay attention to busing, for example, um, or think, pay, pay attention to the meetings. You know, there's things that we're working through. Um, but when I last reached out to Carl, he did uh, point out that Randy was the liaison. So um, basically, the, you know, I'm going to, if there's something that comes up like that, hey, you might want to attend this meeting where this is what we're talking about. My plan going forward would be I'll continue to do the Hanson board chair, but I'm going to reach out to Randy. Randy is the liaison going forward. So that is the plan. If Carl, if I misunderstood Carl, let me know, but I'm pretty sure that's what he was suggesting. So you can even see um, the chair to the liaison. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's typically how the Whitman board does it. We're all assigned to different departments. Right to take the lead and right. the conduit for information or delivery of. Yeah, and Carl was very clear that that was the desire, so I'm gonna follow it. That's why I wanted to bring it out publicly, so if somebody changes their mind, they can let me know, but otherwise, that's what I'm gonna do, because um, that's what I'm gonna do. Mind if I ask so. a question? Yeah, of course. Oh, just make a statement. So, when this all comes to us, you know, I, it, it, it kind of concerned me that, and I'm glad it was Randy sending you the book, because I know Mr. Jones didn't have a, a real, I don't know, he, he just jumped out some words and like, who is this? And I know we all know who Randy <laughs> is and Randy, we apologize for that first of all and recognize you that because you've done this for so long, I just didn't want this to end up being something like here and we're gonna read him the riot act because you know, I was already getting ready to be arrested crossing the Whitman town line, I don't want to get ready again. My point is, is just can we footnote a little bit? Why, why are we seeing this? Yeah, so I think Mike's question was, what is the role of the liaison? Which I think is a very fair question because I'm not sure it really was defined. So what Randy did was he said, here's the definition and he said the definition. So now we all know what the role of the liaison is rather than trying to guess of, well, what is the role of the liaison? So we have it. It's words, black and white, opposed to, well, what does that mean? What does it not okay. mean? So that was really, I think any time we can share understanding mm -hmm. so that oh, we're yeah. on the same page, that's the objective. I just wasn't getting the understanding because the words that I went away with was, wasn't that from, from Mike, and I'm not criticizing yeah. Mike, but I heard, well, who is, he, who is he right now? Right. It was one of the statements. And I, yeah. you know, I kind of take those things to heart, like, yeah. we, we really know who he is, and I don't know. To me, it just presented awkward. Yeah. To be honest with you, Steve, I, I didn't take anything from it personally. Yeah. Uh, I think we've all had conversations that have been tense at times, and I don't take them personal. Um, but my, like I said, my role is just to provide information back, attend yep. more of these meetings. and um, But what I never do is make a – I'm never going to make a decision – on my own so I, I want just want that to be clear that yeah. it, any de decision making is done at, as a, at a full board level gotcha. thank oh, you so much. Thank you. Perfect. And I think thank that's you. all that we were uh, that's all I was looking to thank you. Um, in terms of understanding the role yes does the yes. Hanson Board of Selectmen have to my knowledge no. they do not I, okay I, yes when, when Randy I just oh, I, I can jump in when Randy was appointed when I became superintendent I did ask Hanson if they could have a FinCom person or a selectman person, and that never came to fruition. Yes. Um, I know a year ago uh, when we were talking about the 2014 Desi report and we were talking about um, forming a budget subcommittee as far back as then, and then we were talking about the role of liaisons, um, I guess my question would be, do we have a well-defined definition of li liaison and what role they would play to the school district, whether it's one from Hanson or one from, Hans uh, one from Whitman? And then my other question, and it was pretty similar to Ms. Niffins, is do we have any liaisons from Hanson uh, to the school committee? I know we have Ms. Otina and Mr. Uh, not that Lampier. I'm aware of. It doesn't mean they don't, but not that I'm aware Correct. of. Correct. So okay. gotcha. I can certainly clarify. I'll ask. I think that's a good point. You can circle so back. Don't ruffle feathers of, mm -hmm. hey, you know, we talked about liaison, and if there's anything you want us to understand and how you want to do it. Opportunity for transparency yeah. and communication. Yeah. That's what we're yeah. here for. Can do that. All right. Um, and then do you want to do school choice? Because I, I think I'm trying to get the ones where people are waiting around yep. because they need to either listen what we have to say or they're going to be an Chris, you okay with that? Sure. If about to school choice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the budget sub or budget subcommittee, the, <laughs> the subcommittee, subcommittee I'm, I'm on, I don't know. <laughs> um, we've been talking about school choice uh, with the policy subcommittee. It came up as an agenda item every year. Uh, and we, I've learned some new things too. Um, I, was, I did not know that school choice is 
the standard across the Commonwealth and you actually have to recuse yourself from school choice. It used to be that you had to opt into school choice, but you had to do it by a certain time. The new regs by DESE is it's assumed that every school committee or every district is choice. And then the school committee by June 1st has to decide whether or not they're gonna accept kids from other districts or not. So the policy subcommittee has tasked, um, answered or asked a lot of questions. We actually have Dr. Jones here. He's the primary person for school choice. We have been open since 2000, Michelle, what, 2013, 2014 to school choice at the high school grades nine and 10. Um, we have discussed it. Uh, there's, a, there's a financial piece to this um, that when we brought choice in, it, there was a financial benefit. Right now it's a, it's a, we have kids going out for choice. And let me just clarify, if we decide, no matter what the committee decides, for school choice, our students can opt out to go to any school in the Commonwealth. We cannot prohibit them because we are not school choice. That doesn't go that way. We, if we decide to go not school choice, we just don't accept anybody. Our kids can still go. Our kids go to Tekka, they go to East Bridgewater, they go to Abington, they go to Brockton right now. That's where we have some of our kids. So tonight, the policy subcommittee is going to speak on this. They do have a recommendation uh, for, for next year. And again, by June 1st, I have to report to the department uh, whether or not we're a school choice district. So I don't know, Chris, if you want to take it sure. from there. Yeah. So we, we, as Jeff said, we've had lengthy discussions about this. And, um, you know, the effort is to get a, our best understanding of um, the impact, positive and negative. And um, we basically... We've got some data from Principal Jones this afternoon, and um, we did take a, a vote to uh, recommend that we no longer participate in school choice, because as we uh, see it, um, the, the negatives just ultimately outweigh the positives. And one of the positives, um, as Jeff mentioned, was financial, and um, Jeff provided some information in our subcommittee meeting tonight that was a little clarifying in that um, it's not going to be as a, a drastic of a hit, so to speak, um, initially. It's, it's kind of, we'll lose a little bit maybe the first year, and you could probably explain it better so, than I could, Jeff. So, so just a little bit, if, if we close school choice this year, I lose seniors and I lose any incoming freshmen or sophomores, any incoming choice. Right now we're, we're estimated to, to get $300,000 in school choice revenue for FY23. That doesn't mean we lose 309,000 for next year. What it means is we will lose those seniors or in, in, as they trans, the, the loss of the kids this year graduating and the loss of incoming students. Um, so next year you'll lose a little more, next year you'll lose a little more till that, till all our choice kids have graduated. Because the law states if we close this year, they don't leave. We own those students. They've committed to us until they graduate. So whoever is here for choice stays until they graduate. That's the law. But we don't have to accept any new students. If I could just continue. And I think. Is that, is that oh, clear? Please. Can I add a little bit? I think so to Jeff's point, it's a we, we can revisit this each year. Mm -hmm. it's so it's not a it's not a binding vote. That's important. But I. I want to provide some background as to like what caused us to spend so much time in school choice. Dr. Jones gave us a document. You all have it. You have a hard copy of it, but it's also in the folder um, with statistics regarding students, school choice students at the high school and what programs they are involved in. Particularly, we wanted to focus. I mean, I can speak for myself. I think Michelle mm -hmm. and Chris, too. Yep. Our main focus was making sure that we weren't taking opportunities away from resident students. Um, and it, you know, what concern I had was AP courses, but we talked about how they just will make another AP course. Um, so what it really came down to, unfortunately or fortunately, and you can see um, on the document that you have, I think it's the third page, is um, athletic participation. And so what Dr. Jones gave us was um, the cut sports and the number of school choice students who participated or who were on those teams, um, give or take, or in those programs. You can see some as freshmen, some as JV. Um, the way that I look at this, um, if we look at this past year, 2021 to 2022, if you look at boys basketball, right? I think Dr. Jones in our policy subcommittee meeting said that they had 100 boys try out. 
if we look at this from the, the lens that I was, what was motivating me was you've got four spots that were taken away from Whitman Hansen resident students. And we've been talking on this committee about engagement. Um, we have a lot of challenges in getting our community members to buy into our budget and sort of what we're selling. And um, I think that a really good way to um, harm the culture is for a student athlete who has been playing with his friends or her friends through all the youth sports and then they get to high school and they don't make a freshman team because a kid who moved in from another town does. And now those parents are now disengaged. Why am I going to do this? Why am I gonna do that? Um, and I just think that that, to me, that's where the problem lies. And I spoke at the policy, policy subcommittee meeting, you know, myself personally, my kids are young. They're nine, eight, and six. So I don't, I don't know, and, and friends of my kids don't know that there's a possibility that your kid who's been playing sports, town sports with all their friends can get to the high school and not make a team. There could be five of you who don't make a team. And, you know, it might be, you know, you look at one, you're like, oh, it's just one kid, but that's one opportunity that was taken away from a Whitman Hanson resident. And we talked at Policy Sub about the financial implications, and that was a huge piece, right? Because I don't think that we want to get into the habit of making decisions that might harm our students because financially they make sense. But with Jeff's explanation, we decided that it makes really good sense if we want to promote engagement if we want to pr promote culture of the school community um you know athletics to me seems to be the only place where choice students involvement takes opportunity away from other students and i'm not sure that that is in the best interest of our resident students so can i just ask what was the committee vote on the recommendation i know it was in favor okay so mm -hmm. okay that's i think that's helpful okay don question um First, are we voting on school choice tonight? Yes, I okay. think that is the plan, and I need to open the public hearing um, shortly mm -hmm. yes. as you finish speaking. Oh, okay. Um, say the public hearing is open now. Oh, the public hearing is open now. I know we have a lot of folks that have been waiting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> open the public hearing. Yeah, but um, the public hearing is. I, is the do we have numbers on total number of choice students coming in right now? Do we have yeah, a report of that? Yeah, it's all right here. Which page? Oh, well, the first page. Total number of kids. The last, Dr. Jones, I don't know if Dr. Jones wants to piece this, but the last, the first page has the trends. So this year, there are 50 choice students. So 2021 to 2022 out of 1095. Oh, this graph. Sorry. Yeah. This graph. Yep. And okay. then he breaks it down. He also breaks it all down. On the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Key points, I think it's. Okay, so that's the number in the parentheses. Yes. So it's 50? Yes. Mm -hmm. 50. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's 50 kids coming in mm -hmm. right now. Well, they're, they're here. Yeah. In the yep. they're, they're in the district. Yep. So yep. Um, coming to us. And, and they will, if the vote is to close, use ourselves or yep. whatever, it's a, um, they, they'll be allowed to stay. They graduate here. Um, if they so choose. What concerns me or the information we don't have about these 50 kids, and, and I know you pointed out that, you know, basketball has four choice students so that's four opportunities taken away um, I'm I'm not as concerned with la athletics and school choice as I am about the the opportunity for a student whose parents have a certain need and they end up moving out of town and we need to maintain that relationship that that student has within the district um, that is a social emotional piece for a student um, and you talk about an opportunity being taken away from a district student because of an athletic position and so forth. I'm concerned about taking away an opportunity for a student to maintain their, their, their home. Yeah, their stability. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Forth. Um, the, the other um, comment that right now school choice students seem to be uh, only athletics is taking away that opportunity. I'll be honest, as a district, we don't offer very many opportunities for the arts. We don't have a year-round theater program, drama program, music program, you know, so band, march, we don't even have really a marching band. So I, I need to be honest to say that 
if we had those things, maybe there'd be choice kids coming and, and you know, taking spots away from those or, or, or have a desire to join those groups if we were offering that as a product. Um, I, I'm, I'm very concerned that we are, we are now limiting um, something else for, for students. But we're not limiting it for the students in our district. I think that's what drove us to have this conversation. Uh, one of the questions that we had for Dr. Jones was why are students coming here for choice? What are, to your point, we don't have any of those things. So why are they coming here, right? That, that was the driving piece for me. Right. And if you look at, there's 13, so, you know, the percentages and things like that, you know, a, a student moving aside, the, the bigger picture is what is driving students here. And my task, and I think David talked about it earlier, our task is our constituents, our students, right. and providing them with opportunities. And I see this as something that is taking opportunities away. David, so, David, okay. um, David's I'll come back. Yeah, yeah. So, so two words that come into my mind uh, when talking about school choice is, is equity and disparity. Because the way I look at it from my uh, point of view, uh, spending time in the high school and knowing a lot of kids who either um, were taken away and put into a foster home and they lacked the stability and they were able to come back to this district um, or people have moved away or they don't have good home situations. I don't think people seem to understand that these kids um, love Whitman Hanson. I mean that when we talk about culture, when we talk about uh, well-being, um, Whitman Hanson, not just at the high school, but in general, the community has done such a great job over the years at providing the stability, at providing uh, a sense of belonging in this community. And I think people who come here want to stay here. And when we talk about um, a lot of kids moving out over the last decade or so, or last seven years, I mean, we can talk about universal full day K, or we can talk about the services Ms. Byers was just talking about. Um, in regards to, to losing opportunity in sports, and while I understand that, and, and I appreciate the great work of the policy subcommittee, I, I don't personally view it in that, from that standpoint, because these kids have the opportunity to try out, and, and they're chosen uh, based on their ability. So if they have the talent, if they have um, if they can do the job, then, then they're uh, chosen to do it. So I don't really look at it that way. And when we talk about school choice and we talk about, you know, our district kids, we got to understand that a lot of these kids who are coming into this district, from what I've seen personally, and I don't know what the case is necessarily right now, um, a lot of people have moved out of district and want to come back in, and that's why. So it's not necessarily kids within our community. It's kids who have left our community um, through circumstances that are beyond their control and now are choosing to stay because this is what they know, this is what they love, this is their stability, this is their belonging. So I think by keeping school choice, you're actually keeping that culture and you can say, you know, you're always welcome in Whitman Hanson. Um, and that's something that I, I think is a big part of it. And I understand the financial aspect and I understand the opportunity aspect, but I think you're gonna get the best bang for your buck by providing these kids with the opportunity. And as long as we continue to do our job and we provide these services, you're going to have students come back here because I think context is key. And I was saying that earlier, you gotta think about the last five to 10 years where we've been cutting and reducing services during a great recession, during, during an opioid epidemic. And now we have a pandemic going on and these kids have not received the services that they need. And there's a huge disparity in that regard. However, I think some of the the things that they find comforting and helpful to them is the stability that they have knowing that they can come back here, they can see their friends, and they can just be a part of the community. So I, I wholeheartedly uh, support school choice because I've seen it firsthand, I've seen these students, and I, I know them. I, are, you know, I knew them quite well, and I, I've seen the benefits of having an opportunity to be able to stay here, to be able to come here despite whatever um, socioeconomic uh, situation you have or whatever may be going on personally, you know that from from the time you wake up, you're going to be in the school district and you're going to be with people who you don't care about you um, and, and you feel a sense of belonging and, and I think that goes a long way. So I, I, I see in the short term, I understand the financial impact and the athletic opportunity impact, but I think as long as we continue to do our job as a committee and offer these services and offer this opportunity and support these kids, that I think in the long term impact that really by keeping school choice open, you're only gonna benefit this district. Um, so that's how I look at it, and, and in, in terms of, uh, you know, kids, again, like I just said, as kids leaving the district, I think as long as we continue to provide services and address the inequities that are currently going on, for example, like I said before, full day K and tuition, um, then you're going to see less of that. But we need to do our job, and I just feel like by voting down school choice, we're turning away opportunities for students to be able to continue doing what they're doing. Um, and and uh, 
Yeah, I, I guess that's just how I look at it from what I've seen um, in the school district and, and personal experience. I just, I, I cannot vote against school choice. I think it is important, it's imperative to have the opportunity for these people to continue having the stability that they need and that they deserve. And when we're talking about tools uh, to succeed, sometimes having that sense of belonging, having that stability, having that benefits to your mental health, it will go a long way. And you never know, right? I mean, you could have a kid who is just very committed to Whitman Hansen and school choices provide them with that opportunity and they just, you know, they love the community and they want to get involved and who knows they could be right here, right? So, so I really think we should think about that and we should consider that. Um, but as far as I stand, I respect everyone else's position. And again, I want to put emphasis that I really appreciate the work of the policy subcommittee, but I, I personally support school choice and that's where I'll stand. Okay, okay. hold on. Jeff has been waiting so for I just, a while and I know uh, Chris is here. So I'd it, like it's to- just an yeah. update. So, so Desi changed their policy a little bit too in 19. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause we used to be able to say, keep kids, even if, you know, if, if I, that one of my cells to, to Dr. Whitner was, look, I think we can expand out if a student isn't in grades nine or 10, can we keep them if they're a junior and going into their senior year under school choice? Yes. In 2019, they revised that to say, no, you can't, okay? However, there's a stipulation. If the school committee agrees to allow me to solicit, so if, if Ms. Byers and her daughters moved to Abington and, and wanted her daughter to stay here, I could call the Abington superintendent if you gave me that liberty to say, we could keep kids here and make a deal with the Abington superintendent to either keep them cost free here or tuition them in, but they can't be classified as school choice. So that's the opportunity there, but there would have to be an agreement between me and that superintendent. And that has happened along the South shore already of schools that haven't, because we all are really concerned about kids' social emotional health. Um, But I can't classify them as school choice. So that definition saying, hey, if we go no school choice, that means it's no. So they wouldn't be allowed to stay. However, we go no school choice, and this committee agrees to allow resident students who move out for giving me the opportunity to go solicit that superintendent, like Peter Schaefer, to say, hey, look, I've got a junior here that wants to stay. Can we make out a deal? We could do that. That's an option, yeah. you know, um, that's that's allowable through, through the department. Yeah, Chris. Thank so, you for that clarification. I want to hear from Chris because he's yeah. been... Oh, I'm just, been here for I, I just had the num- I just had a few brief numbers that you'd asked for. Oh, you earlier. did. Yeah. Wow. Um, just for this, just for this year, you had asked for a comparison between the resident students' participation rate in advanced placement courses yeah. and participation in athletics. And for the 2021-2022 school year, we had 290 students take at least one <laughs> AP course um, out of a total population of 1083 for a percentage of 26, which is the, which matches the school choice. So the same percentage of school choice because choice and intake AP courses, or at least one as the students that are here in residence. Um, the athletic information for the same year, what we have for students taking at least, playing at least one sport that are resident students of either Whitman or Hanson are 528 out of 1,083 which gives us a percentage rate of 48, which is double that. It doubles the participation rate of um, students coming in for choice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think Chris was, but oh, sorry. Uh, Chris is waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. David's still here? He's, yeah, he's just, just looking at the bathroom. Room. It's getting, you know, work. Sorry. Um, well, I just, get late. maybe <laughs> Don go first, because I would like to oh. on to David if possible. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, sure, we can Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, I'm just looking at the numbers again. So on the page that you did provide the players per sport for this year, 21-22, I added them up, it's 14. So it's four, or 12? 14. Yeah, 14. So it's 14 students choosing in, playing a sport out of 50. It says 12. 14 out of 50. I, I just have a real hard time Closing this off, and I have, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. and I, and I have, a, I have a hard time um, losing that revenue. Three hundred thousand it is. It's another, but it's like a budget cut. What a, you know? Um, I, I support school choice. I do. I, do too. Yeah. I guess I'll go if that's okay. Yeah, please. Yeah. So I just wanted to say to David, maybe we'll be able to see this or talk to him later, but. 
I completely respect his perspective and I appreciate it and it's, it's, it's a valid uh, concern and it's great to hear Jeff um, present something that could alleviate his concerns. Um, but I just really want to talk about the, the, the negative impact it's had on our culture. And, you know, we talk a lot about doing what's best for students. I'll never make a finance, like a vote for a, you know, financial consideration when I feel as though whatever I'm doing or we're doing is, is, is negatively affecting students. And I'm, that's where I'm coming from. And I, I also think it negatively affects the communities, you know, um, as, a, as a whole. Yes. Particularly because of, of there is, how do you build community? You build it through interaction, right? So, and like it or not, sports is a big part of our mm -hmm. society, a mm -hmm. big part. Right. And it's right. one of the- I agree. The, one of the biggest ways that we connect as a community, particularly when our kids are little. So it's crucially important to remember that and all those relationships and what that means to participate with your friend and to grow up you know, imagining the day when you might be on a varsity field competing where those lifelong experiences take place and those memories that you cherish forever are built in within your own community. I won't ever just put that aside for financial reasons, ever. So that's my perspective. That's why I'm adamantly against school choice and its overall negative impact on both Whitman and Hanson and Whitman Hanson as a whole. Got it. So, is there anyone that hasn't commented thus far that wants to comment? Or otherwise, we're going to move. Mm. Uh, we're actually going to, well, I need someone to make a comment because I'm going to wait for David because he said he wanted yeah. to. I'm sure he wants to be here for the vote, but comment. Steve, you want well, to Well, I, I, I just want to say, I mean, I can hear Chris, David, Don, you know, oh, all of these things are important. You kind of wish there was a hybrid of some sort. <laughs> Don't where say. you know you. It well, sounds like there might be. It, well, and yes can I no. clarify? Well, I mean, really? not exactly. Right. But Correct. Right. Like, you know, let, let Steve. Let Steve. I'm it's sorry. One lane. No, it's okay. It's one lane or the other. It's almost like mm -hmm. you do, and there's some benefit, or you don't, and there's maybe some benefit. But you know, what gets to us is in the center all the the negative parts, of maybe from both sides. So it's it makes it extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I did enjoy it for the revenue choices. Um, I don't know. I'm just still. Uh, I'm still up in the air. I can't yep. really say. But so, go ahead. So Beth, Sorry. I'm gonna go to Beth and then. Okay. So first, I have a question for Chris. Sure. How many complaints have you had from the public um, in regards to school choice? Um, you know, have you had any parents, you know, call and complain about, you know, kids from other towns taking their place on the sports or anything? No, I haven't received any complaints. Um, do you know if the athletic director, if Bob has? Not to my knowledge. Typically a complaint like that I would think would come up to me, but I can't speak for sure Yeah. Um, if it was handled at his level. Yeah. Well, my opinion is I'm just looking, and I understand where everybody's coming from, and if your kid didn't make it, and you'd be upset about it. Um, but I'm also looking at it says 12. You said 14, but it says here on the paper 12, which is 24%. So there's... 75% of the kids came here for another reason and not to pay sports, which is important to me. There's got to be some other reason that they came here. And it can't just be because they're just finishing up school. You know, um, I'm concerned about, you know, and I know you said, you said, Jeff, that now Desi changed the terms and stuff. But I know for years before we have let kids stay here whose parents have moved out of town. I know we have done that, whether it was legal or not. Yeah. It's been done. Yeah. I know because I know personally some people. Um, I'm not looking at the money. I'm just looking at the opportunities. And they have a beautiful building here. Um, opportunities we're trying to make and improve every day. That's what we're doing here. I mean, we're looking to expand the, you know, the arts and stuff. We're looking to do that. I mean, ELL students coming in. You know, we're having the expansion of that. I, I just, you know, I didn't used to think about school choice. I didn't used to care about it one way or another. I mean, my kids played sports, and I've always been of the opportunity that, 
you know, eventually you're going to be in a situation if you go to college and only the best are going to play, only the best are going to make varsity. And you're going to be with a whole bunch of different kids. And, yeah, it's sad when your kid doesn't make it and everything else. But, you know, I'm sorry. To me, that's life and that's how it goes. But I see 75% of these kids did not play a sport. They came to this building for another reason. And that, to me, is making my decision a different Oh, so that's my comment. I'm gonna uh, Michelle and then, or actually I'll go and then Michelle can go. That way you can have you can have the last word. Chris, um, did you recognize me? For no, not yet. Because we've heard. I think we know how you voted and we know the recommendation and I think we have people's positions. So I just want to give anyone that hasn't shared perspective an opportunity to share theirs, which I know oh. you you have not no. and I have not. So you go. Uh, but I'll give you the last word. Um, and then I think we're gonna move to vote. So for me, I think school choice is a definitely a. This is we've. We've, we've had long meetings on school choice before. I remember when it first came up. Um, I have gotten complaints from parents. They are not related to athletics necessarily. Um, and for me, the, the, I think we have a lot of work to do as a Whitman Hanson community to support the kids the way we need to do it. So I look at it as simplistically as I want to get our own house in order for the communities we serve before we start adding more to it in this hope of trying to do more. So that's. That's my perspective. I was very concerned with the point you brought up. Some of these kids out of um, house are actually Whitman Hanson. But hang on, hang on. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, right. So I was very concerned when, you know, the point you brought up, because I wouldn't be able to vote it for, you know, I wouldn't be able to make a decision to not support school choice if I knew there was someone from Whitman and Hanson that was relying on services and then left and there wasn't a workaround. So I feel better about that. Um, but to me, our obligation, our charge is for Whitman and handsome the communities of. And I think I struggle when we start broadening that to others. But that's my two cents. You can give your two cents and then let's vote it. Um, I, to piggyback over what you said, um, you made some great points, yeah. very well spoken. Um, and thankfully, Jeff clarified, we certainly wouldn't want to turn our back on a Whitman Hanson student, ever, ever. I think we're all here to, to support our Whitman Hanson students. You, you said it eloquently. School choice is not about turning our back on the Whitman Hanson students. It's about making sure we only support our Whitman Hanson students. Why would we want to welcome other students when we have to take care of our own? Like you said, our, our making sure our own students are taken care of. So ultimately, student school choice for me is not something I want to support because I want to make sure that we take care of our own in-house, like Chris said. I want to make sure our students in here, for whatever reason, not just about sports, not making a team, it isn't about who made varsity, who did. It's about let's make sure our own students are taken care of in this building before we bring in students from Brockton and everywhere else, regardless of why they came. Let's make sure our own students are okay. It isn't about, us. I mean, yes, we have reasons why they came, but we have our own students and community to be worried about. And yes, sports, theater, whatnot. We have to worry about our own students. I'd rather, so at this point, I, what I'd rather do, because I know you want to make a point and everyone's going to want to make a point, and I think everyone has had an opportunity to share their opinion, and I have a feeling just listening, I think Steve's still churning over there, but I think everyone else has probably made up their mind on what they want to do here, um, and I'm not sure it's going to be changed regardless of what anyone says. Can so I, can I, I would like to, oh. I would like us to move to vote. The vote. Can I, this is the policy, though, yep. and this is kind of... So this was one of the other things. In our policy, it says resident students be given priority placement in any classes or programs within the district over school choice students. So that was a huge concern that we had also mm -hmm. because we can't, we're not, we're we not, can't, we are not fulfilling that yep. and we can't possibly do it and not run into Should legal that not problems. be addressed then, right? If that's a policy. Well, so, but so it's, a, it's a policy that, that it's goes- It's an MASC in, policy. Yeah, it's an MASC policy, but from DESE, it's important to note that once a non-resident student is admitted through choice, that school district must treat the student admitted through choice in the same manner it treats students residing in the district. Okay, so the policy's so, moved. So, so, so we're dealing with policy, but you know, <clears throat> yeah, so whatever we decide to do, policy subcommittee has to address that as well, mm -hmm. uh, based on DESE regs. Can I point a clarification on your ability to um, work with surrounding towns and district superintendent, yep. um, how would that message get out to families? That's my only concern, so, right? So because there may be parents who don't watch this meeting yep. and they just hear, oh, Whitman Hanson doesn't do school choice so, so, and they make family plans to do otherwise. Yeah, so, so basically, and Chris and I have been in the same boat, anytime they, as soon as a parent is ready to leave the district, if they really want their student to stay, the first question is, 
can they stay? Mm. Parents don't even know about school choice in district. They really don't. So that, and we're like, yeah, sure, here's the school choice application. That next step would be, can my kids stay? Yes, the school committee has allowed me to contact. You need to tell me you're sending district so I can make that phone call to that superintendent. It happens all the time. It, so it's, it, it, you know, that, that's it, and it does happen. And as to Beth's point, prior to choice being here, we had kids here that were just here with a wink and a nod too because yeah. we didn't turn our back on kids mm -hmm. so um but that it has to go from 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 you folks to give me the 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 ability to contact that surrounding school and decide whether or not you know they, they can stay and if there's a, a, a financial step so we have a public hearing on school choice mm -hmm. how do you mm -hmm. want to do it are we looking for a motion to you, uh, so it's it's assumed that you're open Okay. So you need a motion to close okay. or withdraw. Thank you, Michelle, because so it's assumed that you're open. Does anyone want to make that? I'd like to make and make a motion to withdraw for school choice for the Second. FY for 20, the 22, 23 school year. Correct. And can we maybe add and we're authorizing Jeff to work with those students that are leaving? Please. Yes. Something As like that. said, yes, <laughs> so. Michelle, you got that? Yeah. That we're going to, uh, so Chris's motion is something to the extent of, well, well you can say uh, it, Chris. Yeah, so I'm, I'm motioning to. Um, is it two motions separate? It might be. Yeah. Because I could support I one of the other. school choice needs sure. to Sure. Okay. Well, why do you need. Yeah, you motion? wouldn't need the second without why the first. Why would you need it if we vote to support school choice? Right, you wouldn't. No, I mean, if, if it, school choice, if we was drew, uh, withdrawn from school choice, then the second motion would be to give the superintendent the authority, I think. Is that what we're yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that might be. If we accept so full choice, you don't need to give them the authority. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do one after the other. Sure. You're yeah. assuming that. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're counting your votes. votes. Sure. Yeah, you're counting your votes. No, <laughs> I'm saying, no, I'm saying, no, I'm not counting my votes. I'm just saying I don't see how. So I'm. So I'm not. I see what you're saying. I'm not voting for that motion then, because I need to know that yeah. the only way I'm voting for right. that That's a big would be problem. if he. I know that the student that he described is okay. Right. No, mm -hmm. I'm not counting Michelle's my votes. Michelle's point. I see. I'm Absolutely. trying to make sure I deal with that issue because I'm, I'm not in favor of shutting it down if I know well, you can't yeah, support it. Right. Sure. But you right. do. You make whatever motion you want. Well, I'd like to make the mo what I wanted to do is include the two. So I'll make the motion to disengage or withdraw, withdraw. from yep. school choice, and I would also like to include authorization for our superintendent to work with surrounding districts um, for those kids that, um, for whatever reason, um, are faced with something that they. Think they may no longer be able to attend Whitman Hanson. Superintendent can step in, work with surrounding districts, and facilitate that. Get all Is that for a motion. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can. Thank you. All right. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Just any discussion. Yeah. Can everyone's clear on the motion. Yeah. Discussion's yeah. open. Go ahead. All right. Um, so I ran to the bathroom real quick. So if I miss any <laughs> data on this, uh, feel free to chime in. But you know, two things I, I keep hearing. Um, Again, it's one, the comfort knowing that the superintendent can reach out to other superintendents to provide students with the opportunity if they leave the district uh, to work with the families so that they're able to stay within the district uh, at Whitman Hanson. However, something I think of uh, at the top of my head, again, from personal experience, is when I see um, a lot of these students who are here from school choice, and again, I don't know the current dynamic necessarily right now, but a lot of these parents aren't necessarily um, involved, I'd say. I think there is a, certainly a disparity um, in some regards that a lot of these students who are struggling socioeconomically don't necessarily have the best home situation. So it's not necessarily um, common for, for them to advocate for that child's behalf. And a lot of the time these students are advocating on their own and they're on their own and they need to provide themselves with the tools to succeed. And a lot of the time they get the stability from being in the place they grew up with or the community that they know. Um, so I think it's great to provide uh, Jeff the authorization to do that but it wouldn't necessarily be effective if the students who are, would be impacted the most from it um, don't necessarily get to reap the benefits because they don't have an advocate there to say, hey, uh, you know, I want so-and-so to say within the school district, how can we make it happen? So I think that's a concern too. But the second part that I keep hearing is that we need to worry about in-house. And I, I totally you know, respect and agree where everyone's coming from when they say that terminology, but I, I want to really put emphasis that a lot of these students who are school choice were former Whitman Hanson students from what I've seen. So I think when you say someone's moved out of the district and they're not necessarily, you know, part of the house. That's not what we mean. 
No. No. Okay. Well, hold on. That's not. I'm not saying the policy subcommittee. I'm just saying that when we talk about working within house and students. So, so why don't you just make your what, make your yeah. position and let's not worry about what other people trying to mm -hmm. infer what other people are saying. So what what is your position or what do you want to share? I, I just want to say that I think a lot of um, I think a lot of students would benefit from having school choice. So I think. Yeah, right. and, I th that, yeah. and I think you've made that point. I think yep. everyone has made their point. So okay. at this point, I'd really like to move to a vote. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you have something we have well, not discussed. No. At One of the comments was a misrepresentation, so I was going to address that. Uh, let's just leave it as let's right. just leave okay. it as we'll agree to we disagree on some of this. Right. Oh. right. Everybody knows what they're going to do. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move. No, to the I vote. wasn't so, talking about you. Oh, so okay. the vote the vote would be to with. Withdraw from school choice, choice with the understanding that you would have the authority to work on placements of people that we that is the vote. Everyone's clear on what we're voting. And say that again? Yeah. So the the motion is to withdraw from school choice for twenty twenty three and authorize the superintendent to work with surrounding districts and allow non resident students to unvote the district. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. great. You said it in half the words, Kristen. Yeah. That's why she does what she does. Alright, are we good? <laughs> Moving to the vote. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor? One, two, three, four. What is that? Five. 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 And all those opposed? That's three. So five, carries. five, three. Oh, yeah, because we have a four. Yeah, yes. we have one. So it carries. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So then we'll be withdrawing from school choice for this for year, the, for and then the, we have to do this again next year, right? We do it every year. Every year. Every year. We, we, yes. Okay. Every year, it's a, it's an annual, it's an annual vote. Okay. And we'll close the public hearing on school choice. All right, thank you everyone. And look, I know everyone has different opinions on this. I think hopefully we all respect those yeah. different opinions. So. Clarification, so the vote that's taken, it doesn't have to be a majority of the total committee, just the uh, yeah. majority of the quorum? Form, correct. Okay, just make sure. Yeah, right. that's okay. my understanding um, as well. The budget one is different, I think, because of the two thirds, it has to be seven. Because, yeah. okay. At least that's what we've done, yeah. been told we can double. Yeah, there, there's nothing sure. in regs to say a uh, uh, majority of the two thirds, it's a majority yeah. vote of the quorum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, where are we going now? We can skip over VoIP update. Yes. Yep. We're going to pass, pass over the phone. And we system. don't have any gifts and we no. don't have any failed trips. No. So we have subcommittee. Anything we need to share with Whitman's uh, we can school building? We can update at the next meeting of the Whitman Building Committee unless you uh, want to speak well, about Well, George and I this morning did a dry run uh, with MSBA on the building, what, what to expect when we meet um, next week. We had four applicants. All four, which we didn't realize, go to them. And then on next week when we meet, um, then we choose, uh, we rank three, two, one points or whatever. Uh, and we, or we just eliminate one if one is not really good. We can keep three or maybe just two. He said that sometimes they don't even have interviews if like there's a real majority mm -hmm. on one. He said, but generally they don't like to do that. So the 19th is our next. So that's a quick budget, sub. budget subcommittee um, busing. We talked about that. And then um, I think we all talked about getting back into the five year plan. And um, yeah, so we talked about the five year plan, OPEB, um, and then I'm skipping over it, but the DESE subcommittee. Um, the DESE budget subcommittee meeting that we had where we talked about hold harmless and probably doing an entire maybe summer uh, discussion on hold harmless. I think that's what I had for updates. Yeah, but did I miss anything? Yeah, no, 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 I just, so, um, yeah, so we last met, uh, was it Wednesday? Last Wednesday? Yes. Yep. Yeah, all right, so we met last week on Wednesday. Um, so like Chris was saying, over the summer, we plan on hopefully uh, working towards putting together a whole harmless presentation used to educate the public. We're also working to get an OPEB presentation out there. Um, some current conversations we're having with Mr. Stanbrook is the idea of a reserve fund. We're still early in the conversations regarding that, but that's something we're looking into. And um, obviously, as Chris just said, we're looking into the five-year plan. We're still continuing to work on that. Our next meeting is April 27th at 6.30, pretty sure. So that's what we got going on. We're busy. We're meeting pretty much on a weekly basis other than next week, <laughs> yeah, a nice little break. Week, right? uh, yeah. But we're at it and we're getting there. So that's what's going on. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thanks. Yeah. Um, negotiation subcommittee. So this is on here because we need to um, appoint someone for B, C, and D. So B is administrators, C are administrative assistants and D are paraprofessionals. We're very close. Uh, Wait, say that again, B is what? B is administrator, so your APs, yep. your directors, yep. 
Uh, C are your administrative assistants, and D are our paraprofessionals. Um, Cindy and I are meeting tomorrow to firm up more things in A. Yep. So we're pretty close with A, and we, the, the, on bequest of the of the association, they would like to get some folks on board so we can get some times to look at B, C, and D. Yeah. So B. So we need someone for B, someone for C, someone for D. Jeff and George will be participating mm -hmm. in. They're splitting yeah, those we're up. Splitting those up. Yep. The thing that um, Jeff and I talked about is we anticipate that these probably won't. It would be nice, but I'm not sure they'll be done before elections. Mm -hmm. um, so our thinking was, again, will the committee, whatever you want to do, was it might make sense to get someone to do B, someone to do C, someone to do D. It doesn't have to be three people, but perhaps people no. that aren't up for election so we don't run into a situation where someone's negotiated something and then they're not reelected and then they have to pick back up again. So that was our thinking. So I'm off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Me too. Uh, well, I am anyway. So. Um, but so, uh, but that, we can that, do whatever you, you want. But that was oh, yeah, that, that was the rationale for our out. thinking yeah. is avoiding a situation where someone gets eighty percent of the way and then they're not there anymore. So, um, so any volunteers to do B, C, and D, or a, a volunteer for B? Admin, Chris, great. C, B, Chris, said whichever. How how may I serve? Oh, great. <laughs> Anyone for C or D? Anyone? I want to, I need to call to see if it's something I can do. I just want to make sure, sure. that I'm doing it right and not going to get into So you'll do waters. one as long as you're if being I ethical? Can call, if right. someone can, I, if, if I, I, I can call the ethics commission call ethics, and I they think you can say do you're fine, but I don't want, yep. I, I don't want anyone to say or yep. to <laughs> allege things that. We understand. So call ethics, but I think you're clear to do something. Anyone else okay. willing? I believe you are. I can. I know not you. Huh? Anyone else? I could. Probably do D. I worked with a lot of paras at India. That'd be great. I'd be working right with George. Thank you. Thank you. So, anyone else? Oh, I get to work anyone else George? as an alternate so, if oh, okay. very clear. Hillary can't? Hillary, Hillary can do it. Let me take it. No, let's send it. You need an old. Oh, thank you. you All right. So, we have three, and then David said he'd do it. Awesome. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. We, so, B will be uh, Scriven. You and I. C okay. will be. Uh, C, C, sorry, what do you, C is up in the air right now with Hillary. Hillary, if she's if uh, ethically allowed, otherwise David, and then D would be Stephen. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you all for doing that. We forgot mm -hmm. this. So I just um, yeah, we'll bring that back. Okay. I'm just scanning anything yeah. else. Uh, so academic, did we miss academic calendar? Did I miss? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I missed it too. Yeah. I'm looking mm -hmm. at the old one. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, do we just need to vote updates? Yeah, vote, uh, I'm looking at voting in the update. We had to change grading day to the end of the year. We moved it till the 17th because we had moved it with the extension of our five school days. Oh. So grading day will now be on the 17th. It was a week prior. So, so can we get a motion to accept? Motion to accept. Second. Any discussion? Well, so the half day was on the 10th. Yeah. Now that's going to be a full day and yes. the half day is on the yeah. 17th. Because we extended the school year. And there'll be a district wide yeah, message that, that will go as, up. As soon as you guys voted, it's going to go <laughs> up tomorrow. <laughs> so that's why I want to do it today. Okay. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Unanimous. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Policy, uh, policy subcommittee. Anything else to add other than I think yes. appreciate your work from earlier? Yeah. 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 We yeah, actually go ahead. Yeah. We have one policy. Do you mind if I take it? Or do I have a couple things, but go ahead. Okay. Do you, sure. mind, <laughs> do you mind? So in your packet, Nadine was here before. Yeah. Um, we are out of compliance with policy. EFDA and I presented this to the policy subcommittee really the major it was a couple of tweaks but the major tweak was removing the lines under E record keeping removing uh, letter C graduating seniors and students that transfer out of district must pay all charges and full failure to do so may result in not being allowed to participate in graduation that's against the law and we shouldn't have this in policy so I wanted to get it amended so that it's clean so this, the policy subcommittee unanimously uh, um, supported all the changes in this document. And I just need school committee approval. So we don't have it on the agenda, Jeff. It, um, or do we? It's. I, I thought it was. I thought it was. I don't. Under policy subcommittee, it's a. It, that's a subcommittee report. That's not a okay. vote. Uh, okay. Okay. I mean, we can do it next time, but I don't think we should. I okay. Mean, if we're not going to let, if we're not going to vote. Capital, then I don't think we should vote. Okay, yeah. okay, clean. That's fine. Um, yes, but I good. Agree. I got you. Yes, okay. go ahead. Um, yeah. So, for the past several meetings we've had on our agenda, um, looking at the policy of 
administrators coaching and AD coaching along with where we stand on school choice. We've had both personal experiences and we've had constituents come to us with concerns about culture. And that's why we decided to put the, well, why I, as chair, I put those on the agenda, not to target the individuals, but to understand that structure dictates behavior. And when we see behavior that we don't feel comfortable with, it's natural to look at the structure. So, and, and we, we felt as though school choice was kind of integrally involved in our concerns. So that's kind of the history of, of, of how it uh, got to this point. Um, thankfully, uh, uh, Jeff has, has offered to work with the policy subcommittee um, through workshops and, and maybe over the summer or sometime soon and you know maybe bring in um, some of the uh, stakeholders in this um, and, and make sure that we are um, ensuring positive healthy culture for our students um, because that's what that's about right and that's what I'm about so it's not that my kid didn't make a team it's that I'm looking out for our communities no. and the best interest of all that's what we've been discussing um, for our policy subcommittee so thank okay. you thanks Facilities, facilities not not legislative anything. so just a quick thing I did as the liaison to our reps I re reached out to Allison Sullivan had a great meeting with Allison in Lincoln and she put do playgrounds in Whitman on the governor's budget mm -hmm. so I don't know if we've received any funds yet but those will offset some of our capital expenses if the governor funds some of that specifically around Conley and Duval and the playground numbers that we sent out. So great meeting with her, great meeting with Lincoln. Um, I met the new um, representative from Dis District 1 in Hanson today um, and legislative while I sit here, I was part of a check. Um, we, the town of Hanson received two checks today, one for 50,000 plus and one for 249,000 plus in CARES money that we filed thanks to John on December 31st. Um, I think we're getting a bulk of that $240,000, $250,000 check, which will come to our district revenues. Yes, John? This is 245000 Okay. So I don't have the check in hand, so I don't want to report, but that's going to be coming just like CARES. Thank you to Representative Cutler for calling me the day after Christmas to say the town of Hanson hasn't <coughs> used all of their funds. Let's not give it back to the state. Do you have funds that you can recover? Okay. So. Lisa Green helped out tremendously, John, and, and we were able to do that. So that's the legislative piece. Great. Pilgrim Area Collaborative? Yes, we uh, met last Thursday evening. It was our April meeting. Um, we're still on Zoom. I think the governor's thing was extended out for districts, and I think the collaborative just feels safer. Um, it, it goes out now until, um, I don't know, middle of, of July or whatever. But uh, top three things that we covered, we had a new tech director on the call with his um, technology plan uh, 2023 through 2027 and we did similar with the strategic plan um, went over that um, we had to get our tuition billing in line i guess it's been a while like 30 years um, so <laughs> like a regional agreement <laughs> don't worry it happens um, so we did that and we base it on Plymouth because we exist in Plymouth. We base it on their, their public schools and, and so forth and what they have. And that was pretty much it. It was a good meeting. It, uh, unfortunately, we're close on um, quorum, so, but we made quorum and uh, that's it. Great. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to go into an executive session, uh, but before we do that, uh, the only other note I made, so our next meeting is scheduled for May, what was it? on the schedule no may 13th may 13th, I may 13th. so um that would be after town meeting mm -hmm. so um we're not planning on doing another school committee meeting unless someone wants to suggest that we're going to do another school committee meeting prior to that it's so. may 11th I'm it's may 11th may 11th yeah. sorry it's may, may 13th is friday That's a yeah. <laughs> may 11th is our next school committee meeting so yeah. there was some conversation earlier about capital items and looking at those, the only way we would do we the only way we would be able to do that is to meet prior, 
Um, so I'm looking for someone to make a motion to meet prior or we're not, which I'm also fine with. Uh, I just have a, I yeah. have a question for Jeff. Yep. Jeff, no, um, this is back to the playground thing. Okay, because that's on the, that's on going on the town meeting for Whitman, right? Uh, we presented it. The capital committee supported that. I don't know if the selectmen or the FinCom. Because but I was just wondering because you're waiting for money. So if. I believe it's on the warrant. No, so I, they, it's, I, they won't, we won't know the money until August. Yeah. When the governor. So what do we do? Then so they would vote it and then it, it would be re reduced. Reimbursed. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and I, the selectmen can do that, right? The reduction in the amount. Yeah, once they once if, if it doesn't have to come from us. No, if right. money came in I think from that's, that. Yeah, that I what you're asking. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think right because I know they'd send it directly yeah. to them. Literally right before town meeting. Yeah. Meeting, they're literally changing yes. the numbers. Yeah. I think the important part is placement. Okay. Um. All right. No meetings until I'm, May. I'm, bit, I'm booked. Good. I know I'm booked. You're booked. Right. Too? You're booked. Great. Then I'm um, booked. Surgery next. You're week. booked. I'm booked. Oh, no. Then prior to, uh, so we will be going into an executive session to conduct strategy sessions in prepara preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. This one was specifically to determine the salary range of benefits for the contract of the new special education director. We will be not. We will not be taking any votes other than to adjourn when we come out of executive session. And I get a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. Yeah, second. And that is a roll call vote. See, I was not. Steve. <laughs> yes. Michelle. Yes. Don. Yes. David. Yes. Chris. Yes. Hillary. Yes. Chris. Yes. yes. Great. Thank you.